community members. Um, and there are no public hearings on today's agenda. So we'll start um, by just letting our participants know that the city is really striving into a vision co-created by the city staff and community for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. And this vision is really designed to promote free conversation and dialogue while also recognizing that we wanna make sure everyone who's participating uh, feels safe. And we want to ensure that we make space for different viewpoints in our meetings. And we also have a lot of information on our website about what we call our productive atmospheres vision if, you, if you're interested in learning more. There are a number of rules of decorum that are found in the Boulder Revised Code, and we have some general guidelines that are advisory in nature to share with all of our meeting participants. We ask that all remarks and testimony raised tonight um, be related to city business, and we will not allow any participant to make threats or use any other forms of intimidation against any person in this session. Obscenities, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts the meeting or otherwise makes it impossible for us to continue in the moment is prohibited. And we also ask the participants identify themselves by the name they are commonly known by uh, and to display their first and last name before speaking. So we, we know who would like to provide input. We're in the Zoom webinar format, which allows for participants from the public to speak at designated times but we will not be turning on video for community members because of security concerns. And uh, we ask that you raise your hand if you wish to share comments tonight. And on your screen, you'll see a couple different ways to do this. At the very bottom of your screen, you'll see a horizontal menu with three clickable items and you can click on the hand icon and it'll let us know that you'd like to speak. And if you have an expanded menu, you can also get to the raise hand icon by clicking on, uh, on reactions. So that is everything I wanted to cover. Um, thank you again, if there are any members from the public with us tonight and over to you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move ahead with a, a little bit of an unusual meeting tonight. Uh, we have no hearings going on this evening, but we do have a very important informational uh, uh, session in front of us. And so in order to do that, I just can let you know that this is a joint meeting with the Housing Advisory Board and uh, and some the, the technical uh, review group that uh, the city has assembled to, uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, but before we move ahead with that, uh, we also have the opportunity for public participation and so, because there's no hearing tonight, all topics are open. And so I invite any member of the public who wants to address planning board on any topic uh, to do so now. And uh, I think Vivian will uh, run that public participation session for us now. So thank you, John. Um, as John mentioned, this would be the the time for you to let us know that you would like to speak um, and share your any comments. And I do not see any raised hands. Okay. But, oh, we just had one. Um, Mark Fear, Fear um, and you have three minutes. I'm not sure I can pull up the slide quick enough, but I'm keeping my, I'm, I'm timing it and I uh, I might interrupt you with the three minutes, Mark. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, I Let's won't go. be taking three minutes. I wasn't planning on speaking. I'm just here to learn more um, about the ins and outs of inclusionary zoning. Um, but uh, the only thing I would do is, uh, it's not clear to me if uh, to increase the amount of affordable housing in terms of what's required of developers from 25% above that. It's not clear to me if it's a planning board who would make that recommendation to city council or if this is city council as a policy issue, they would uh, decide on their own to do that. But that's my only comment is I would really like to encourage the city to have a higher uh, threshold of uh, affordable housing in, in future developments. That's it. 
Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for coming and sharing your views. Anybody else would like to speak at this time? No other hands are raised, John. Okay, thank you. And Mark, I think uh, uh, just to respond to your uh, question, I think on that issue, probably planning boards likely would make a recommendation to the council, but it would be a decision to be made by the council uh, uh, dealing with the with the uh, number that you're inquiring about. So, all right, let's uh, move ahead with our uh, study session, and uh, I'll turn it over to Jay, and I think Jay was likely to invite everybody attending to introduce themselves, but Jay, uh, take it away. This is your night. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. I'm Jay Snugnet. I'm with Housing and Human Services. I am the Senior Manager for the housing side of um, Housing and Human Services. I oversee the homeownership program as well as the uh, planning and policy group. So joined uh, with me tonight, uh, you'll see Michelle Allen, who is the Inclusionary Housing Manager, um, as well as Sloan Walbert, uh, who recently joined us from Planning and Development Services. So she should be familiar to a, a lot of you. Yeah. Um, so they're really the front line for inclusionary housing at the city. They are the ones that interact with uh, developers very early on in the pro in a project, help them to understand what their inclusionary housing requirement is going to look like and what the process is. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very high level overview. Um, and Sloan, if you could pull up the agenda or the PowerPoint. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle and uh, Sloan because they're, they're the experts um, and can really take you through it. So, okay. Yes. Jay, uh, you might ask everyone attending just to introduce themselves. And Yep, I have a slide. I just wanted to set the stage a little bit um before we get into introductions but i promise we will do it okay very good um so again as john mentioned this is really a study session think of this as a sort of a 101 a learning opportunity it's really not a discussion about policy at this point um, if you would like to have a policy debate um, i'd be more than happy to go out for a beer with you at some point but um really this is the opportunity for you to ask questions, how does the program work? We're gonna get into some really, the really nitty gritty details um, and hopefully um, uh, stimulate a, a pretty interesting conversation tonight. So we're gonna give you an overview of what the existing regulations are. We're gonna talk a little bit about what the upcoming effort looks like. Um, and um, most importantly, give you the opportunity to ask those questions. So um, what we're looking for is uh, this group to really help us to make the best recommendation to council possible. So again, this is setting the foundation, um, a lot's more to come in terms of policy alternatives and analysis. So next slide. So the agenda, we're gonna do some quick introductions, as I mentioned, um, a little bit of background. I'm gonna talk about the high level of affordable housing, history of the program. Um, Sloan and Michelle are gonna get into the nitty gritty and as I mentioned, the next steps, uh, we are going to ask you to hold your questions uh, to the end. Um, otherwise, I'm, we're a little bit concerned we might not get through it. But if there's a burning question or if um, John and Sarah, if you feel like there's a, an appropriate place to stop and ask questions, we are open to that. Um, just felt it might be a, a little bit easier uh, and that a lot of questions might get answered if we just continue with the conversation. So. A little bit of before we introduce everybody. So there, I think everybody's familiar with planning board. It's a quasi-judicial board. You guys make decisions. You also make recommendations to council. Um, housing advisory board recently formed, well, relatively recently, about five or six years ago. Um, they're purely advisory um, and meant to help council address um, or give them advice on how to address our housing challenges. The group that you might not be familiar with is the Affordable Housing Technical Review Group. So that's a, a seven member group. They're appointed by the city manager and their primary role is to provide recommendations to the city manager on how we award affordable housing funds. 
so they're a little bit different as well. So there, they, um, there is a requirement for professional experience related to the affordable housing industry. There's one commercial lender with experience financing residential projects a realtor or other real estate professional, um, and then two as well at large. So I um, get, now's the time for introductions. So I'm gonna ask everybody uh, to just very briefly give their name, which board they're with, and um, just state what your profession is, sort of what expertise do you bring to the conversation? So John, you wanna start? You're at the top left for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm John Gerstel. Uh, planning board chair, uh, and I have a professional background as an environmental and water resources engineer. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Silver, um, planning board, and I'm the executive director of a, of a private family foundation that focuses on social inclusion and cohesion. Philip? I'm Philip Ogren. I'm on the Housing Advisory Board. I'm a computer scientist. I work in a machine learning research lab. Angela. I'm Angela McCormick. I'm with the TRG, and I um, am 36 years as a real estate professional in commercial finance, construction, development, and brokerage. Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Kaplan. This is my first year on the planning board, appointed last April. Uh, my professional background is I am a public policy facilitator, working mostly in California, actually, uh, water, flood, habitat restoration, forestry, uh, those kinds of issues. All right, Mr. Boone. Yeah, um, George Boone, planning board. Uh, my professional background is in um, uh, real estate uh, development, hospitality, entitlements. Uh, and I'm a, a, a private developer as well, commercial property. Michael. Hi, Michael Lucchese. I'm chair of the Housing Advisory Board. I have a background in journalism and spent the last 16 years as executive director of Urban Land Institute, Colorado. I retired last year and I still do some consulting. Good to see everybody. ML. Good evening. Thank you, Jay. My name is ML Robles, and I'm on the planning board. Also a newbie, been on here less than a year. Um, my profession is I'm an architect here in Boulder. I specialize in small houses and ADUs, and I am also a researcher. Mark. Hi, Mark McIntyre. I'm uh, along with Laura and ML. Um, uh, a uh, freshman planning board uh, member. Um, I had uh, owned a technical engineering sales company for 32 years. I, I also own some commercial real estate and I'm considering myself an amateur at most everything. Danny, are you well enough to speak? I am. Uh, hi, all. Uh, uh, Dan Teodoro. I'm a real estate and uh, land use development uh, attorney. I've been on the housing board for, wow, it's about five years now. So almost five years. So nice to see everybody. You don't want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Um, I think I got everybody. I didn't miss anyone, did I? No. All right, so we'll keep going. Next slide. So there are two council priorities related to um, affordable housing uh, that came out of the 2022 session. First one is what we're talking about tonight. Um, and really the, the direction from council was to revise the IH code to focus specifically on increasing middle income units. And we'll talk more about that. Um, the other priority specifically for housing and human services was to launch the middle income down payment assistance pilot I'm um, not going to talk about that, but if you're interested, it is going to go to council on uh, March 2nd. So just some background that's super obvious to this group. Um, so you can see the bottom line is area median income. Uh, that's been relatively flat since 2010. Um, you can see sales prices for attached homes is the orange line, blue line. Uh, we finally broke the $1 million uh, sales price barrier for single family homes uh, back in 2020. 
I'm hoping that didn't quite, uh, I'm hoping that flattened out a little bit this year. I'll, I'll have that data in a couple of weeks. Um, but I think you all know what the problem is. Uh, and next slide. And it's something that the city of Boulder has recognized that, you know, basically housing prices have been outpacing income growth. Um, and as early as 1966, we formed the, uh, our, or we formulated our, the uh, housing authority. And then all through the years, there have been different improvements. And I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. Um, there is a great, this graphic is on the website and there, there's detail about each of these um, that I would, if you're interested, I would encourage you to take a look. The main thing I wanted to point out was that inclusionary housing was adopted in 2000. Um, and there have been two major updates over the years. So just like any program, um, it re requires refinements, um, adjustments over time as market conditions change or as um, you know, policy uh, priorities change. So we're gonna do that again this year, um, but uh, it's important to keep in mind, next slide, that you know, the, the city of Boulder's program is extremely mature and I would say highly successful. Um, so you can see that uh, we have 3,815 units that are permanently deed restricted homes. So we're at about 8.1%, those numbers, I think we're gonna get up to 8.3, maybe even 8.4 with the new 2022 numbers. So we're, we're well more than halfway to achieving our 15% goal. Um, and it's also important to note that, you know, a lot of communities, uh, particularly immediately adjacent, so Lafayette, Longmont, Louisville, um, they used to provide our affordable housing and now they're finding the same challenges we do uh, and are starting to adopt inclusionary housing programs. And they're really looking to Boulder um, in terms of uh, providing guidance on how to um, address their problems as well. Um, this graphic with the house in the middle, I think is worth explaining. The, so this basically is a time period between 2015 and, um, I'm sorry, 2016 and 2020. Uh, so it shows out of every 100 units that were built, new, this is new construction, 81 of those were market rate and 19 were permanently affordable. So that's new construction. And that's largely through IH, and we'll talk about that more. Um, but the, the orange line is what's really important for, and the only way that we're gonna be able to achieve our goals, we're not gonna be able to build our way out of it, um, is that those 17 units, we're also able to preserve. So basically acquire existing housing that was market rate and deed restricting it and making it permanently affordable in perpetuity. So next slide. Um, another piece that I wanted to talk about just as, as context, uh, there was this pretty significant shift and this shows pretty dramatically that the, the system as we set it up back in 2000 served us well. Um, at that time, we were getting quite a bit of ownership. Um, most, there was a fairly decent mix of ownership and rental and we were getting on-site ownership rentals or ownership units, excuse me. Um, but that shifted around 2012 um, was probably the most uh, uh, pronounced change. And it, it was a, a number of different factors. There was the great recession, of course, the housing bubble burst. Uh, there was changes in, in financing as a result of that. There's also construction defects laws um, that were passed. So it's a variety of different factors. Um, but what we're seeing is that um, today we're seeing primarily rentals and very few ownership. And, and when we want, when we're talking about middle income and the need for middle income, it's really about ownership, right? Because middle income households, they can typically afford to rent in Boulder. It's when they make that transition from uh, rental to ownership that becomes challenging. Um, and it's also really the other thing to keep in mind is there is no state or federal funding for ownership, um, particularly about when we get above that 60% EMI. So we have to rely on those local funding sources to achieve those policy outcomes. All right, next slide. Um, almost done, just two more slides to try to set some context. So, we're going to talk a lot about um, funding and how important that local funding is. So it's really crucial for us to achieve our affordable housing goals. 
So those local housing funds we get, the, um, the cash in lieu, the commercial linkage fees, um, the local excise taxes, property taxes that, we, that you all pay, um, all of that gets leveraged with outside sources, two, three, sometimes $4 in state and federal funding. So that allows us to produce more housing. So that, that cash uh, actually produces more housing than if we were to require those sites to be built, um, those units to be built on site. So that, that's a really important piece to keep in mind. Um, it also has lots of other benefits. So we can create a range of household types, so serving different incomes. Uh, so primarily through our housing authority, Boulder Housing Partners, we can serve people of much lower um, AMIs, so 50, 30 um, percent AMI, um, really providing uh, housing for people in, at different um, income areas. It also um, helps us to get preservation. Like I mentioned, those extra 17 units, um, and we can use that to purchase that existing housing, deed restrict it, and we're not um, you know, really disrupting the, the natural balance of things. We don't get a lot of opposition to acquisition like we do with um, the construction of new affordable housing in the community. Um, but more, most importantly, this, this map to the right, um, I would argue you know, one of the main benefits is that we get greater distribution of housing so that we are able to preserve units. Um, otherwise, this map would look very different. I think there would be fewer dots um, and those dots would be concentrated in parts of the city where we're seeing the most growth. Um, so, you, we, um, so to me, the, one of the main benefits is that it provides a, a more diverse, um, geographically diverse affordable housing. Next slide, the last one I promised. Uh, so despite all our successes, um, there are still challenges. So that market emphasis on rentals that I talked about, um, the challenges of trying to get middle-income homeownership units, um, you know, the, um, the fact that the housing market has been slow to recover. So, you know, it used to be just Boulder and mountain towns uh, in the, and the coast that with housing challenges. Now it's a national conversation. Every community is being challenged with affordability. And then on top of that, we have um, high inflation as well as higher interest rates that are, are making our jobs even more difficult. So we have lots of challenges ahead. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Sloan. Okay, thanks, Jay. <clears throat> so I am going to just sort of cover some high level, the affordable housing tools used by the city, and then some of the specific IH requirements. Um, and then I'll hand it to Michelle to sort of get into the nitty gritty. So, um, just to sort of set the stage, most people probably know this, but um, some of the commonly used terms and acronyms specific to inclusionary housing. Um, first one being when you typically hear the term affordable housing, it's actually referring to it, what we would call attainable housing, which is housing that's affordable to individuals and families earning close to the area median income and costing no more than 30% of their income. The city doesn't track this type of market rate housing in the city. Um, so in terms of the program, permanently affordable housing is deed restricted and it's affordable in perpetuity. Um, then area median income, also known as AMI, it's a federal calculation based on census data for Boulder. So because it's a median, half of households make less than that 100% AMI and half make more. So the income limits for both rental and homeownership are established at different percentages of that AMI. And to qualify for the rentals or homes, the household income needs to be at or below that designated AMI. Um, so in terms of how we define that, low income households range from 0% to 60% of area median income. Um, moderate would be 61% to 80, and then what we call middle income is 81% to 120. Um, and then on the screen, it kind of shows you to what that exact calculation would be. For this year, um, it'd be 
thousand dollars for a household of three, sixty-three thousand for a household of one. Okay. So it's important to note that inclusionary housing is just one of the programs like Jay was describing that the city uses to provide affordable housing. The three regulatory tools that generate affordable housing are annexation, the IH program, and then funding. So planning board's probably pretty familiar with it, but in terms of annexations, a proposed annexation needs to demonstrate community benefit consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, and that's intended to offset potential impacts of development. Um, so for residential development, the emphasis is given to the provision of permanently affordable housing. That's typically 40 to 50% of new housing must be affordable. So historically, annexations have provided sort of the greatest opportunity to create affordable ownership opportunities. But as um, the city sort of infills and we come up against the growth boundary, um, that sort of appears to be decreasing. And then in terms of funding, as Jay described, we do receive funds from property taxes and those commercial linkage fees. Um, this graphic just shows that since 2015, the city has received over $85 million. Um, and that includes federal funds like CDBG funds. And then that amount of funding for cash in lieu and IH kind of varies year to year based on development activity in the city. Um, this graphic kind of shows the outcome of the three tools since 2000, and it also sort of reflects that decrease in ownership projects sort of starting in 2013. You can see that big dip right there. All right. Um, so just to get into inclusionary housing, um, generally speaking, inclusionary housing, it's also referred to as inclusionary zoning is really a policy or set of policy that requires developers to set aside a percentage of new units to lower moderate income households at below market prices. Um, for the city, these are codified in the land use code and there's also a set of administrative regulations on how those are actually implemented. Um, it's a mandatory requirement and the in intent is really to increase the supply of affordable homes and also where possible integrate into neighborhoods um, racially, socioeconomically. It really taps into the economic gains from rising real estate values to create those affordable housing opportunities. <clears throat> so the IH program requires that all developments, regardless of size, contribute a percentage of new housing as permanently affordable. So for developments with more than five units, the IH program requires 25% to be of new units to be permanently affordable. Smaller developments, um, including single family homes have that 20% requirement. Um, this requirement can be satisfied by one or more of the, the options shown on the screen. They can provide the affordable units on site, integrated into the development, that's what was originally intended um, through the program. They can provide the affordable units offsite on a different parcel of land they can make a cash in lieu contribution or dedicate vacant land for um, future affordable housing development. I'd also just wanna point out there's some differences between the requirements for home ownership and rental projects. Um, Michelle's gonna get into sort of the details on that in a minute. And it's also just important to note because the inclusionary housing requirements only occur in new residential development, the location, type, size, and other details are really dictated by developers. We can't influence the tenure of the development, whether it's ownership or rental, the location, or any of the other characteristics mm -hmm. um, through the development process, basically. <clears throat> um, also just important to note that affordable housing has to be comparable in quality, design, um, and just general appearance as the market units that are creating the IH obligation. There's some specific livability standards to ensure that permanently affordable housing is functional, um, meets the needs of a range of types and sizes of households, um, meets code standards, and also has high quality building design and construction. Um, that's typically reviewed through the discretionary planning review process, but um, can also be done through sort of an offsite uh, review to make sure that it meets the requirements. 
I um, also just want to note that the required affordable units for development are of the same types and bedrooms in the same proportion as um, the market rate dwelling units. So that would be the same tenure, ownership versus rental. Um, and then just for your reference, the unit size requirements for each bedroom type are shown on the screen. And then um, the average unit size is used to determine um, what's generated through the IH requirements. And then the cash in lieu amount is also based on the size. Michelle's going to get into detail how that is calculated in a minute. Um, so in terms of outcomes, as Jay described, for the first 10 years of the program, many developments provided those units on site. But since um, the market's changed and there's um, additional complications, um, most projects now contribute cash in lieu. And um, you can see here that's as of the end of last year, that's $63.8 million. Um, it's also important to note that the ability of a developer to provide it on site is really related to the size of the project. Um, that's because if you have a larger project, you may be able to use LIHTC funds to help um, some federal funding that helps you fund the project. Um, so there has been a couple on-site affordable projects um, in the last couple years, um, which is sort of a new, new development. Um, I think Michelle's going to talk a little bit about the change as well. Um, but really, we talk about cash in lieu as the workhorse of the program. It's important to note that a developer can always opt for cash in lieu even um, when they're pulling a building permit. So sometimes um, they really can't give us an answer on how they're gonna meet the inclusionary housing requirements until they're in the building permit process. But um, uh, as Jay described, IH is really a key tool in generating the necessary funding to produce that broader range of homeownership opportunities and rental opportunities. Um, and really the reason for that is because cash in lieu contributions can be leveraged um, against other state and federal funding to provide additional units. Um, and then, so for 2022, that amounted to about $10 million. Um, and cash and lieu, which you saw in that earlier graphic, is about half of all the housing funding sources for the city. So really, the bottom line is that we're seeing very few affordable units produced directly through the IH program. But as for all the reasons Jay described, it's cash in lieu is still a really good option to satisfy the IH. All the options that are given can still provide very, um, very much needed affordable housing in the community. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle now and she can um, jump into some of the details. Yeah, <clears throat> hello. So um, actually, can we go back one slide? I just wanted to point out that um, up until recently, and I'll, I'll go into more detail about it, rental projects really couldn't do affordable units on site without going into a public-private partnership, which they were very reluctant. Well, none of them chose to do. And most development was rental. And so that kind of skewed the whole program over to um, new development paying cash in lieu. Um, the few for sale projects we had by and large also paid cash in lieu, but since most projects were rental, the outcome was sort of a foregone conclusion. So we can move forward. That's changed and I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, I wanted to talk about two, two major issues that I think are frustrating um, for, for um, planning board and for council. Um, and that is the timing and why we uh, why the program was set up to allow developers to choose their option later in the process than most people would like. And the other thing is about why we allow cash in lieu as an option at all, actually. So the first one, timing, um, 
the program, as you, as I think most of you know, um, allows a developer to change their option or decide on their option up until the time of building permit submittal. And this is basically because the way the process works is that developers get an, get entitlement. So that's their site review approval. And then they go out and they get all of their partners, their banking partners, their equity partners, their insurance partners, and all those folks who all have opinions about this, um, about whether they should put affordable, can put affordable units in the project. Um, and so they don't know until after they have the entitlements and they're actually in the in the um, construction environment, they understand better understand the cost of the project, um, what the project is going to look like, um, and you know there's a lot of a lot of costs that can come up through a site review uh, review. Um, their density can change, their road configuration can change. They could have flood mitigation issues, costs, big costs, and construction costs aren't yet what they're the environment that they're going to be working in. So they need to get the entitlements first, and then they go out and they determine what their, they, now they know what their project looks like. They get all their partners in, their equity partners and everybody else. Um, and then they can make an informed decision as to whether they really can put affordable units on the project. Um, so uh, essentially, if, if they were to try to commit to something at concept plan and site review, they may have all the best intentions of the world, but but they may not be able to do it. They they really don't know until they've got their entitlements and they've basically got a project that they're working with. So bottom line is that the decision makers need to be comfortable with the proposed development with or without affordable units on site. Compliance with inclusionary housing is guaranteed. They're going to comply. They will not get a building permit without complying. But we do, but but we do need to give them options so that if um, on-site affordable units aren't viable, they their project can move forward with a, a, a cash option. So um, someone asked me at one point, um, what if they do promise something at concept plan or site review? Well, you know, they should be questioned because they probably are saying they might be able to do it. They'll try to do it. They may be able to do it but it's unlikely that they can guarantee that they'll do it. So next slide. So related to that is, is the whole cash and loot option. Why do we allow it? Um, number one is because it's a great option. It's a great um, a community benefit for the, for the community. It provides significant benefit as we've talked about, um, both Jay and Sloan talked about. We can leverage that cash in lieu to get more affordable units and we leverage it with funds that come outside the city, state and federal funds. That's money coming into Boulder. That's a great benefit to the community. Um, we can get a wider variety of housing um, and respond to whatever the council um, priorities are at a given time, whether it's transitional, permanently supportive, senior, middle income, so we can be very responsive. And that the that money is critical for maintaining the existing affordable housing stock. Um, and it ensures that option ensures that a development can move forward when affordable units simply aren't viable. And they cannot be viable because, as I mentioned, the the partners that they get after entitlements um, may, you know, first of all, they may not have a, a viable project from a from the standpoint of a return on investment. They 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 need a return on investment in order to attract an equity partner. Without return on investment, they have no financing. Um, and um, another big complication is that there's a state rent control statute. It was amended a couple years ago, um, and it's making it easier for private developers to um, construct, own, and operate affordable rentals in a rental project. However, that state st statute requires that the city offer a developer options other than just uh, deed-restricted rentals. And so the most typical option is cash in lieu. So hopefully that answers a few questions, probably brings up a, a whole lot more. <laughs> we could talk about them later. Um, so next slide. So I wanted to just um, put this in so people can see sort of the stack of how um, the city's affordable um, strategies serve everything from zero income all the way up to middle income. 
So we call zero to 40% AMI very low income. It's also a HUD term. Um, and those uh, affordable units are they're either rental units or they're beds or they're permanently supportive units. Those come about because of um, local funding, which is primarily cash and loo, and then these other leveraged funds from outside the city. And generally, um, most of them are done by BHP, but we have other partners that do, um, do, do that type of housing as well. Then you kind of get into the, the low income, which is 50 to 60% AMI. And again, that those come about because of uh, funded projects and are primarily constructed, owned and operated by the city's housing authority, Boulder Housing Partners. They're gonna, all of these are gonna be rentals. And then you get to the inclusionary housing level there's overlap. So um, a lot of funding for BHP um, rental projects is at the 60% AMI level. And most IH rental units are also going to be at the 60% rental level. So we're sort of a little heavy on 60% rental um, units in our requirements right now. It's something we're going to be looking at. Um, IH, um, the rental um, AMI is 60 and then there's a small amount that's 80%, but most developers, rental developers can't use that 80% because low income housing tax credits don't allow those. It's gotta be 60% or below. Then in the IH world, we move into uh, the for sale product. Um, the most IH for sale units are gonna be priced at the HUD low income limit, which is determined annually by a HUD. And right now it's at 71%. So you can kind of see we're going 40, 50, 60, 70. Um, and so that's 80% of IH units are at that HUD low income limit. Only 5% of the, or you know, 20%, depending how you do the math, but of the 25%, 20% are low income priced and 5% are this range of middle income pricing, um, which is between 80 and 100%. Um, and so the, the low mod and the middle income IH units would be for sale units. So next slide. So we're gonna run through really quickly, what does this mean? So 60% AMI, which I said we're a little heavy on, that's sort of our rental metric. It's always been in the program and in our funding world. Um, that's sort of a go-to AMI, um, considered sort of a, a, a workforce income. And a one-person household would earn fifty-two thousand six eighty. A three-person household would earn sixty, no more than sixty-seven seven forty. And that's then the rent, rents are set to be affordable to those incomes. Next slide. Low mod income is the is what most IH uh, for sale units would be priced at. It's seventy-one percent AMI. And that's a one-person household earning 63000 and a three-person household earning $81,000. Um, they can earn a little bit more um, because we want to have a range of buyers. These are for sale product. So there is um, a range around those incomes where people can qualify to buy these units. Next slide. And then we have our 5% um, middle income um, tier in the IH program. Those prices are gonna be set to be affordable to people earning between 80 and 120% AMI. Again, it's a for sale product. It's a range, there are actually three tiers in there, but I didn't wanna get into that detail. So one person household can earn between 70 and 105,000. So that's the 80 and the 120, the two bookends. And a three person household between 90 and 135, again, the two bookends and people in between can qualify to buy those units, but we we right now that th this is the the golden goose that we're chasing after. We would really like to get more of these middle income for sale homes. Uh, we by we I mean council, and so that's the the goal of the update is to look at how we can get more middle income for sale um, units, affordable units. Okay, next. So there's also been raised a question, it kind of comes and goes, um, uh, which is, it doesn't make sense to do affordable home ownership when it's a limited appreciation product. Um, people don't understand that product um, very well. Um, 
for many, it's the only opportunity to own a home in the city of Boulder. They might be able to own something out in Frederick, but they're probably not going to afford to own something in Boulder. Um, limited appreciation ensures the home re will remain affordable over time, but, th but some appreciation is allowed every year and its average is about 2%. And over the time of, of a you know, reasonable amount of time for owning an affordable home, the uh, affordable house, uh, the household that owns the home will build enough equity possibly for down payment for um, a market home. Um, and and there, are there are big benefits to affordable home ownership for lower income people. And the, probably the biggest one is stability. Um, it stabilizes families. Um, it gives them a fixed housing cost that they can rely on. There's no rent e increases, and they can't their lease can't be canceled at you know um, at the most inconvenient time for them. And that means the kids have a lot of stability. Um, so it's great for children, and the kids stay in the same school over the course of of the years that they own the home. So that's really beneficial to the community. Um, there is a, a this sort of um, you know, pride of ownership is huge. It's huge to helping a lower income household um, really understand that there are, there are there's help out there. There's people out there that will help them move up through, um, you know, through the income ladder and through the housing ladder. And, um, you know, um, there's been studies that have shown that people participate where they live, not where they work, but where they live. And so when people own homes in Boulder, lower income people, they're much more likely to participate in the public discourse. So there are a lot of benefits to home ownership, but it's up to council and, and planning board's advice to, to decide whether that they, they outweigh the, you know, the, um, the challenge in getting ownership units. Next. So these are some metrics around the program. So for sale units come from for sale projects. If somebody has a for sale project, IH says 25% of those units have to be permanently affordable. Um, again, they do have options, but if they would like to put those units on site, they do need to be for sale as well. And so if they're gonna put um, any or all of them on site, 80% will be priced at that low moderate income level. And um, you guys have the printout from this presentation to study. So when we come back, you know, with our option um, suggestions and recommendations, um, you know, you can, this will be a good, a good thing to keep in your back pocket um, with all of these income levels and what, what do they mean? But 80% um, priced for low moderate income, which is currently around 70% of the AMI and 20% priced for middle income, which is between 80 and 120 is the range. These products, of course, are going to be condos. They're for sale. Um, they're occasionally single family homes or townhomes, but by and large, they're going to be condos. They're sold to individual owners, which means that they are just scattered. You know, the, the, the IH code says they have to be scattered throughout a project. It's not a problem because they're just sold off. Um, so they're in, integrated throughout the project. They have the same quality construction because they're all constructed, the for sale and the market at the same time. They're mixed in a building. And for the same reason, all the amenities are shared. Um, the whole project will be turned over to an HOA once it's um, all sold and the amenities are shared. You know, the biggest problem we have with for sale affordable units is that the HO fee, HOA fees can, can be high. Um, and that's a challenge, not for only for our program, but for IH programs all throughout the country. Next slide. So this is a big piece of what we're going to be looking at in the um, in the update, because uh, the council direction was to look at how we incentivize on site um, for sale, and particularly middle income units. Um, and so we have these three incentives. I just talked about um, this pricing split, just as a reminder, so you can refer to that as I'm talking about this. So right when we when we um, updated the program in 2018, that's when we added the middle income tier. We went from a 20% requirement to 25, and that additional 5% was middle income units, affordable units. 
we knew at the time it will be challenging for developers to um, provide those units on site. And so from the get go um, at, in that update, we built in incentives to try to encourage um, and use a carrot to get um, some on site for sale units. Um, so the three that we have are small developments of less than 20 units, all permanently affordable units can have middle income prices, you don't have that 80 20 split. Um, if they put half of the requirement on site, they get a reduction in cash in lieu on the other half that they owe. So when somebody does some on site, usually the other, what, what they don't do on site, they pay cash in lieu for that. And so there's a reduction in cash in lieu if they put half on site. Um, then if they would put 75% or more on site, then the pricing overall can go to a 50-50 mix of low, mod, or middle income. So when pricing is is shifted to middle income pricing, of course, that's more revenues for the project, um, should make it look more attractive to put those units on site. So we're gonna be looking at these because they haven't been, um, you know, they haven't been uh, very effective actually for encour encouraging developers to put middle income units on site. Um, so this is a big piece of what we, um, of what council wants us to look at and where we'll bring back options. The next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about rent control because I'm, I'm going to get- No, no, I'm so sorry, Michelle. Just I, that, that last um, slide was actually fairly a little confusing. Yeah, sure. Go back. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Centered. Are, are these incentives what we're discussing or are these the incentives that exist? I'm sorry. I they that exist. We built them in in 2018. Okay. And they, I would, I would say they were not robust enough to really uh, make things happen, which is a bit disappointing. But we, you know, we continue. So now I'm going to go into the rental side of the program. Um, and so many people are um, familiar with the fact that there is a state statute that, um, for a long time, prohibited rent control in Colorado, um, and the we could still. Um, implement inclusionary housing on rental projects, but they had to do it through a public-private partnership, um, and that wasn't attractive and wasn't of interest really to anybody for a lot of um, a lot of reasons, and it didn't result in any on-site rental units, um, which was not honestly very surprising. Um, and so, all rental development up to a couple of years ago paid cash in lieu. Uh, in 2021, the state law was amended. Um, so that we didn't need a public-private partnership anymore, and a private developer could own and construct, own and operate affordable rentals in their project. Since then, we've had two large projects that have done that. Um, Weathervane and Spine Road, both Weathervane's under construction and Spine Road is at the end of its entitlement project um, process. So, um, but... The state law was amended with requirements, uh, and we, of course, are subject to the state law that at least one other option has to be available to a rental development um, in, you know, in another option besides providing rent controlled units. And um, the local government has to enact laws to increase density and availability of housing. Um, there's a whole list of things that local government um, could do to meet that second requirement and, and Boulder has done a number of them. Next slide. So rental, and this is set up a little bit like that for sale um, slide. So if a rental project comes in and we assess it for IH and they say, we wanna put some units on site, they can be rental units. They could also be home ownership. It doesn't go the other way around. Home ownership projects cannot do rental units unless they want to do um, something like a lot more of them, which they don't, <laughs> um, like a two to one or something. It's a, le a less desirable product, but rentals could go to a more desirable product. A rental project that wanted to do home ownership, and we did have one that did that, um, can. So, um, so a rental project comes in, they want to put units on site, let's say a, a weather vane type project. 80% of the unit of the required affordable units, which is 25%, are going to be um, have rents affordable to households earning no more than 60% of the AMI. 20% for 80%, although um, neither of those projects 
utilized the 80% tier because they did utilize low income housing tax credits to build those rental units. And those don't allow, um, well, one of them utilized tax credits, the other one did not. Um, but tax credits don't allow 80% rents to be utilized. So there's a mismatch here. And we'll be looking at that in, in the update. Um, there are no incentives because when we did this, um, honestly, the state statute kind of uh, controlled everything and made it virtually um, not possible for rental developers to put rentals on site. Again, that landscape has changed. We're excited about it. And we do expect more rentals to be provided on site in the future. So the rentals are, of course, going to be apartments, which are different. They're not condoed out individually. They're not individual legal things um, at the get-go. Um, so they can be provided in two different ways, according to the code right now, because we weren't sure which way would be the most um, utilized or the, the best approached. So we kind of left the code um, in 2018 where they could do the, the rental units either integrated with the market units similar to condos, or they could subdivide off a part of their project and do um, create separate lots. And then there's essentially a separate project under different ownership because it's going to be a LIHTC partnership ownership. It's a, a different entity. So um, in the integrated scenario, of course, the share amen shared amenities are sort of a given because the units are in, are, are interspersed with market units in the buildings and everybody shares the amenities. It's sort of uh, just a given. Um, they're, they're under, the construction quality will be the same as the market unit because they're gonna use all the same subs and they're gonna use all the same materials and do, the construction is the same for the market and the affordable units. And it'll be under the same owner management, typically, although they could have a different management company that um, manage their affordable rental units in this scenario. In the um, in the separate scenario, shared amenities are complicated, but they are required by the code, and we do enforce that. They've got to share the amenities. It's not as easy when you essentially have two different projects that are funded differently. Um, but and again, we have only one example of each of these so far, so it's not like we've got a deep um, experience in this. Um, the quality is not insure, insured um, because it's a separate project. So it's not the same subs. It's not the same building materials. It's, you know, so we do have to keep a close eye on the quality of the construction and the materials. And they're going to be separately owned and managed than the market project. So move on, please. So to give you an idea of what rents look like, so the blue portion of this um, table has 50, 60, and 80% rents. The 60 and 80% rents are what the code re um, requires now. If somebody comes in and they wanna do onsite affordable rentals, these are the rents uh, for this year, they're adjusted annually. Um, they are adjusted based on HUD data um, and, um, you know, everybody uses the same numbers, essentially. We don't set these rents there, but they do reflect the what a household at 60% um, or 80% AMI can afford. But notice they go by bedroom. They do not go by size. That's sort of an industry standard. Um, and then I put the 50% in because we are thinking that it might be good to create a, a broader... Um, to in increase the range of who can, of the rent of the rentals that can be created through inclusionary housing, because we do expect expect more uh, on site rentals in the future because of the change to the state statute, and perhaps we want to consider adding a fifty percent tier. Um, Eighty percent will keep, although they're not going to be able to be used by most people. And then I went out. And this was very um, very off the cuff. I looked at three recent developments. So this is new construction. Um, and um, I basically just went on their websites and look at what they're, what they're marketing says that they're charging these days. And these were the, the rents that they had. So it's a, a bit, um, you know, it's quite interesting, um, especially the zero bedroom, which tend to be very small, uh, 450 to 500 square feet. 
and they're by and large charging $2,200 for this. Um, and then the one bedrooms, again, there's a range for all of these because they've got some, at, you know, so I kind of, I kind of did an averaging thing as sort of the average rent. It's not there. They have units that are higher and some that are lower, but as you can see that they're, they're getting up there, 28, 27, that's almost 29. The two bedrooms are 3,000 to 5,000 a month. So kind of crazy the rents that are being charged these days. So affordable rentals are still needed, much needed in Boulder. So next slide, please. So um, I actually did this as an exercise internal to staff and everybody thought it was so interesting. We all thought that you might find it interesting as well. Um, so there's a lot of um, confusion around why things play out slightly differently in different projects. And so I wanted to sort of um, go share this with you. You'll again, have this in your back pocket for further conversations, but it, it kind of follows that other chart that I just showed that with the, um, you know, the for sale and the rental um, onsite. So there's, I have one chart for onsite and one chart for offsite. And so again, for sale, um, projects that do units on site, they're going to be dispersed because they're condos. They're going to be constructed at the same time as the market because they're in the market buildings. They're going to have amenities shared through an HOA and their design and finishes will be the same as the market. Rentals, on the other hand, we had the two models dispersed or aggregated. Um, the construction um, timing is required because it's on site to be concurrent to the market. That can be challenging. Um, amenities are typically, they have to be shared um, for either whether they're dispersed um, or aggregated. And then the design finishes are either going to be equal to the market or separate project, um, which is one that we have to keep an eye on the, de, on the quality and the design and the finishes. And then the land is a different animal. A land dedication is the other option. We've only ever done two in the program. Um, since 2000, so 23 years. Um, but again, this might be something that we see more of in the future. This would be a piece of land that is within a project like Diagama Praza. It, it is a piece of land um, on the site of, of a project. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about a piece of land that is elsewhere it, that's um, used to satisfy IH. The result of that land that um, is dedicated to the city, we don't keep it. It's basically land banked, and our our land the 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 housing authority holds on to these pieces of land that we're going to build uh, projects for in the future. The city doesn't keep the land. We we turn it over to our designee according to the code, and that will always be the housing authority. And then they're gonna do a project on it. It will be 100%, just like any other funded project that you see like Rally Sport or some of these other ones, you're gonna see a project that is aggregated um, in 100% affordable buildings. Uh, the concurrency is not required according to the code right now. Um, it's land banking. So the land is gonna be used to build affordable housing at some point in the future. So it does not have to be built at the same time as the market project that um, gave us the land. Amenities are not shared because it is essentially a separate project. And um, the di design and finishes um, we have confidence in because it'll be the housing authority and they do um, very nice work. Um, and then I kind of left annexation in here because annexation could be whatever's in that annexation agreement. Um, we have certain things that we negotiate for um, currently, but annexation agreements are negotiated and then they can sit up on the shelf for years. And so they pop up and they've got all kinds of, you know, they can be an annexation agreement from 20, 25 years ago, and they can have all kinds of things in them. So they are, it, annexation is a little bit of a, of a, you know, loose cannon. So um, now for offsite, um, same thing. If somebody says, I'm, I've got a for sale project and I want to give you units um, offsite somewhere else, um, they can be dispersed or aggregated. Dispersed means probably they're going to buy a single family home and dedicate it to the program. Um, they could buy a condo. Nobody's ever done that yet. But again, the future, who knows what the future holds. Um, or it could be aggregated into a whole nother project. True Corners is a, is a project um, up in North Boulder that is all uh, for sale 
And that was an offsite project provided by um, 29 North, that big rental project, 29 North. Um, so that was 100% affordable. It's a lovely project. I think people are really happy, happy there, but and it's a for sale project. The construction, again, needs to be concurrent to the market. That's challenging. Um, actually, I, I, I um, th that's not correct. The construction can be within one year from when the market development um, gets its CO. Uh, uh, the amenities, if they're, again, this is offsite, it's nowhere near the market project, probably. We don't um, typically put amenities into affordable projects. And so we don't require them for offsite projects. We want housing. Um, and, 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 you know, again, if you put in amenities, you have an HOA, you have HOA fees, it, it, it's not necessarily a great thing for the, for the owners, they want nice housing, they don't want a bunch of HOA fees to, to support a bunch of amenities. That's definitely what BHP has found, or what we found. Um, and then again, the design and finishes depend on what the, the, the they're doing. Um, uh, uh, the single family homes that we've gotten through inclusionary housing, we got the last one probably 16 years ago. Like single family homes are not very attractive anymore because it's hard to find one that, um, you know, that works. That is that, that the cost makes it worthwhile to buy a single family home and, and deed restrict it. Um, for rentals, if they do them off site, again, they're gonna be, they, they propose a site for these projects. We do have a review process to determine whether the site's acceptable to the city. So there's a whole process around that. Um, there's criteria for the site, was, you know, what kind of zoning does it have? Um, is it compatible with the adjacent community, et cetera? Um, but um, the site is proposed that, that again, is gonna be a 100% rental project. Um, th this is the, the concurrency for both of these actually, one year from the market project. They do have to put up a financial guarantee to ensure that the project will um, come online and come online relatively soon. There are no amenities required for offsite projects and it's the design and finishes are something we have to keep an eye on. And then land when it's provided on elsewhere, um, offsite that would be Mount Cavalry, gonna end up with a, because um, we've only ever done the two, um, uh, an aggregated project, in other words, 100% affordable project, the concur concurrency is not required with land. It's land banked and a project is, is developed um, when there, there are funds and you know capacity to develop it. So the land, what, the land dedication option is really a land banking option. There are no amenities typically required in a funded project and then the design and finishes are determined by BHP. So, um, so those are just two charts for you guys to have and to think about um, as we move forward with uh, the update. And so let's move forward with the next slide. So now we're gonna talk about cash and loo and how we do cash and loo. So right now we have two categories uh, for cash and loo. Um, developments with five or more units and developments with four or fewer units. They're kind of separate tables. Larger developments with five or more units have a higher cash and lieu um, just across the board than developments with four or fewer units. The reason that that division was done um, and it was done back in 2009, I think, uh, update to the, to the program, was because there was a desire to um, sort of keep IH uh, more modest for single family homes and, and these uh, you know, four or fewer unit developments. That, that was the desire of council at that time. Um, the cash and loo is divided into three types, single family, which is the highest amount of cash and loo, um, townhomes, and then uh, like a duplex to an eightplex is a middle amount of cash and loo, and then large attached, which is primarily large apartment buildings, has the smaller smallest amount. But they're they're actually not that much different from each other. But there is a slight difference in the cash and loo between these three products. Um, the cash and loo is determined based on the gap between a market and affordable prices. But it doesn't differentiate this. This gap analysis does not differentiate between for sale and rental units. That is not what we're seeing in other programs. So best practices is something that our consultants are looking at, and we might want to divide it out 
um, for a calculation that's, uh, that separates out a for sale gap and a rental gap and it can be done. Um, the wow. amounts um, are based on the average floor area of all the units in a project, that's very typical. And it's applied on a sliding scale um, for unit, if the average size of units is 500 square feet, it'll be lower. It's a square foot. It, it results, the whole, the whole methodology results in a square foot um, cash in lieu amount. And so a 500 square foot unit, you take that square foot amount and multiply it times 500, 1200, you would do the same and everything in between. There's a, a, a big table. You can pull it up on our, our website, which we'll give you the link for. Um, but it, it's capped at 1200 square feet. So if the average size of units in a development is say 2000 square feet, the cash in lieu would be the same amount as if the average size of unit was 1200. This was again, built into the program um, when the program was adopted because there was a desire not to, um, not to, um, to require higher cash in lieu for bigger units. That um, probably has changed. We'll find out because it's certainly one of the options that we're gonna talk to you guys in council about. But so one thought we have is that this 1200 square foot caps probably should be either eliminated or moved quite, you know, back when the program was adopted in 2000, units were an average of 1200 square feet. That's not the case anymore. Okay, so move on to the next slide. So um, again, what do we do with the money? People always want to know. Um, they're combined with other funding sources. They're competitively distributed. That's what our TRG is for, to help us uh, um, determine what the, um, the funding applications, who should get what amount of money. Uh, funding requests exceed available funds pretty much across the board always. So there are fund rounds where um, people who want to build affordable housing come in and they, they um, petition the city to get funds to do their projects. Um, and again, as we've sort of driven home, um, these lo our local dollars are leveraged with dollars outside of the city. Um, the money is used for construction of new affordable housing, preservation, which is the acquisition and rehabilitation of existing housing, and land banking for future projects and other minor things, but those are the big three. The next slide, please. So I did want to talk about our policy around demos and um, rebuilds because it's something that we're probably going to propose a, a, an update for. Right now, uh, the way the code is written, and this has been in again since the code was adopted in 2000, uh, if you demo four or fewer units, IH is waived for the new replacement homes. Um, this primarily applies to single family homes. That's where we see it play out day in, day out. People are demoing single family homes that are modest and fairly affordable and rebuilding much larger, more expensive homes. Um, however, a new home on an empty lot, should you be lucky enough to find one, not replacing a demoed home can't qualify for a waiver. So this isn't really equitable. A new home on an empty lot is going to be assessed for IH, but if you tear down a house and build a new home, you're not. So there's an, um, you know, that's not, not really equitable um, policy. Um, and it's becoming more and more of an issue where smaller homes are replaced with much more, with much larger, more expensive homes. And so we're, um, right now, staff is thinking that um, probably keeping it at, at this four, so if you, if you demo uh, more than four units, let's say you demo 10 units, you don't qualify for a waiver. It's capped at four. So keeping that four, but if somebody demos uh, four or fewer units and particularly a single family home that they, we would assess them for IH for the additional square feet over um, what they've demoed essentially. So the, this is, um, so let's see, let's move on to the next slide. So um, our IH webpage is very robust. There's a lot of um, good stuff on there. Um, there's a handy unit and cash and loop calculator for developers so they can put in the numbers for their project and it will tell them how much the cash and loop is, how many affordable units are required and what affordability level they would, they would be priced or the rents would be set at. There's a link to the IH code and the ad administrative regs. 
Um, there is a cash and lieu worksheet. It's a PDF that you can print out. It's that scale that I, I was talking about that you guys might be interested in. There are two cash, uh, two affordable price sheets, one for low mod and one for middle income. And then there's a, a rent table um, that for the rents that apply to IH, it's like the table I showed you and other different forms and things are on there. So um, we're, again, we've already started the IH update. We've hired a consultant, Kaiser Marston and Associates, um, also known as KMA. They're looking at best practices for um, these types of, you know, updates like um, on-site middle income and how we determine cash and lieu. They're, they're all gonna, they will help us to, to test the feasibility of any options that we bring to you. So we make sure that they are actually feasible. And they're gonna, um, they will have recommendations on updates um, based on their experience, which is what we hire them for. Next slide. So um, the council direction again was to explore uh, strategies to increase middle income housing. This is um, our strategy right now is to primarily acquire middle income housing through increased funding, um, not so much directly through IH because um, in order for IH to produce middle income housing, we need more for sale housing to be built in the city. IH is a function of what is being built. Um, so to that end, we would like to look at the incentives and strengthen them or look at things that are maybe gonna be more effective. Um, we also want it, again, it, to increase funding. Um, one of the strategies is to have cash in lieu for larger homes and then have this uh, cash in lieu requirement for, for single family homes that are demoed and replaced. Next slide. And of course, since we're coming in with a whole program for updates, we will be looking at um, some other um, more minor program updates that we think are important and that are responding to sort of current conditions. Um, one is to modify those IH rents possibly, uh, adjusting our cash in lieu, not, not so much not the so amount, much the but amount. We, sorry, am I missing something? Um, but um, the methodology for how we determine cash in lieu, and uh, uh, there are a bunch of other minor tweaks um, that, that the code needs to be kept up to date. So next slide, please. So I have a few different project schedule slides for you. This one talks about the project schedule and community engagement. Um, it's pretty high level at this point. We're still working on our community engagement approach. Um, we've already hired the consultant and started our initial, initial analysis. Um, they will be working through May, giving us some interim sort of um, reports and feedback. And the final report, though, they're not really expected to give us until June. So we will still, though, be moving forward on alternative development and testing um, while they're doing their work as well. Then we will go into our stakeholder feedback um, phase um, in May and June and then uh, into the code development um, phase after that. And one thing I do wanna say about this is that, um, you know, I, I wanna add a quick note about the community engagement approach. Uh, it's expected that increasing affordable housing opportunities will advance racial equity in the city, um, but we're also taking into account the intended and unintended impacts of housing policy on racial inequities in the country. Um, and we've completed the racial equity instrument for the IH update, and that's included in your memo. So that, that will just be um, um, ongoing, as it says at the bottom. Racial equity assessment is ongoing, and we will develop, monitor, and revise strategies to identify and address impacts on racial equity as the project moves forward and we are looking at options. So the next slide. So these are some of our um, initial. Somebody ask a question or. Okay, sorry. Um, our, so our, 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 um, this is sort of our initial plan for levels of engagement. Um, as you can see, January, we're kicking off with this 101 for planning board um, and the HAB and, and TRG. In the spring, the city is gonna do sort of a world cafe kind of format 
to inform the public of housing priority work related to housing. There's a number of initiatives that the city is doing related to housing. So we will be included in that outreach. Um, and that includes the occupancy um, work, the updates to inclusionary housing, the middle income down payment assistance, zoning for affordable housing, um, things like Boulder Junction phase two, which will have a bunch of affordable housing. So there's a number of things that will be folded, folded into that. Um, in June and July um, is when we will probably have some pretty mature options to put on the table. Um, and we will be going to, of course, Boulder Housing Partners, who is our main um, partner in developing and creating affordable housing, the TRG, the Housing Advisory Board, Planning Board, um, and of course, the public. Um, and then in August is when we expect to get to, um, after we get feedback on the options from everybody in June and July, we will go to city council for the um, code updates. So first reading and then the public hearing. Um, and then um, after that in um, September and October, we have to update the regs before the code um, updates can go into effect because we need the regs in place to implement the code. Next slide. So again, this is sort of an overview of the approval schedule. Third quarter, we'll be coming to planning board first, then code updates to council, and then fourth quarter, we will be updating the administrative regulations and the new code will go into effect. So that is the end of our presentation. We're happy wow. to answer questions. So I know I went fast. I didn't want to take up the whole meeting time with, with this um, because I know there are a lot of questions that people have and um, you can always refer back to it to, to the presentation. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Let's, uh, let's hear the questions. I see Philip has his hand up right away. Well, I have more of a comment than a question, but I could rephrase it as a question. Uh, I, I have been thinking about ADUs lately and about occupancy lately. And I wonder if you've thought about ways to um, uh, have, have some uh, synergy with occupancy and um, ADUs. Like it, it, the, one of the things I've been thinking about is um, there's a lot of vacant rooms in Boulder, uh, by my estimate, probably about 30,000. I'd love to have someone uh, give me better data uh, if they have it, uh, but I could I could give you my detailed um, analysis of, of the data I used. Um, I think it'd be super cool to think about ways to use inclusionary housing policy to incentivize people to let out rooms at affordable rates or to um, incentivize building ADUs that uh, would, would be permanently affordable. Uh, maybe there'd be a possibility for small grants or small um, uh, incentives to homeowners that would that would take on an affordable uh, uh, renter. So, anyways, I just uh, because because all this stuff is swirling about occupancy and and um, uh, ADUs, it seems a little strange to to just uh, have this completely separate over here where where we just focus on new housing and uh, uh, buying off existing housing. So I'll just do one comment at a time, so I won't be too long-winded. <laughs> okay. So Jay, or I think that's uh, a Jay question. You have any response? But uh, or we can move ahead if you don't. We, yeah, I'm not sure. I have a a, a great response. Um, I I understand what you're saying, Philip, in terms of the interconnections. Um, but I mean the incentive for ADUs, for example, with IH is that it doesn't apply to an ADU. It, it only applies to the principal dwelling. Um, same thing with occupancy. Occupancy isn't necessarily impacted by IH. Um, but I get what you're saying. Is there a way to incentivize both of those things through IH? And I don't know, we have to think about that and get back to you. George. Yeah, OK, thanks. Um... On the topic of the presentation, um, you had mentioned at the front of it the idea of the middle income housing being 28 to 30% of someone's income. 
And I, I, what I what I'd like to understand is sort of the breakdown to understand what that means, because there's lots of ways to slice that. Um, meaning, does it include the interest and principal on a mortgage? Is the mortgage assumed at a 30-year AM or a 15-year AM? Uh, does it include the property tax? Does it include the insurance? Does it include the utilities? Just, it would be helpful because there's so many, it'd be helpful for clarity, I think, for us and and just to, just to understand what goes into that calculation. So, you know, we can understand sort of the parameters of what that 28 to 30% really means. Sure, I can I can address that. So it's a reverse mortgage calculation. It is principal interest in taxes. Um, it also has a, a multiplier in it for um, for mortgage insurance. Um, it is based on a thirty year mortgage with five percent down, um, and that is what most affordable buyers are. That's the product that they're probably going to get. We don't have our homeownership people here, Jamie. You might know that, but you know the, the affordable units um, aren't necessarily. They don't. People don't get use all the mortgage products to buy them. They they're going to typically use a thirty year fixed mortgage because that just makes their payments affordable. Because that's how the calculation works partially. Um, but that that's the way it works. Um, does not include utilities. Rent rent does include some utilities. It's sort of a utility. Um, um, credit um you know it's not it's not obviously the exact utilities that everybody has but there's a utility credit figured in to the rents so that we so the rentals um we do at 28 percent of income and the the for sale are at 30 percent of income thank you and um uh that that was that was super helpful. I was just trying to and 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 just along that line, uh, current Boulder AMI. I remember last time we had a presentation. It was somewhere around one hundred and three thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, what is, it, is that you still know, the it, case? Yep, and I think that's a family of three. So it, it's actually divided out by number of people in the family. So the AMI is this range, and I think one hundred and three is is an is the AMI for. Um, a family of three, meaning half of the families make more and half make less. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks a lot. Sure. Michael. Thank you. Um, like my colleague, Philip from HAB, I think I'm going to be more commenting than questioning, but um, just give you an idea of what the discussion has been like in our last several meetings. We've really been talking about um, zoning quite a bit, and if there's any utility toward affordable housing by um, uh, some incremental uh, and sensitive splitting of single family lots, for example. Um, we had a, a presentation on that from a national expert in December, which is very interesting because it suggested you don't really get a lot of affordability just from that simple rezoning for a greater or lighter density. And we see that in Boulder. There's a lot of townhome development going on in Boulder now, and it's at a very high price point. So I appreciate Michelle's comment about the challenges with single family homes. And some of that is because the homes are very large, but even in these more uh, compact uh, townhome developments, we're seeing really high price points. So um, I think what we have been musing about and not anywhere near make a recommendation, but it's just a conversation is, can we be looking at some incremental zoning reforms combined with IH? And so if a developer were to do, for example, four luxury townhomes, there is an affordable home ownership opportunity included with that. Um, some of these newer developments have, are more than five. They're, I don't, I don't know a number, but it seems like they're 15, 20. So it doesn't get at that issue of a broad scale affordability, but it does provide more affordable housing potential with some more uh, social mixing potential to uh, 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 slightly reverse the, the trend in public school uh, registration, which is plunged so much. And um, my final comment is, uh, you know, there are potentially a couple of large, larger tracks of land worth in that where you could get more bang for your buck with such an approach, um, not to endorse this, but there's certainly been discussion about the airport recently, it's 138 acres, uh, planning area reserve too. 
and even um, uh, commercial areas that are underperforming that have large parking lots. So I, I see some potential there. It's a um, conversation we've been having at HAB and I'm hoping we can come up with some good recommendations. I want to commend uh, the city housing staff for the really great job they've been doing in a difficult environment. And this presentation tonight was extremely informative. So thank you for that. You know, Michael, I, I would say that um, we we meet weekly with the planning staff working on the, the um, zoning incentives. So we're all um, definitely talking to each other on the same page because we have to make sure all these tools work together. You know, right. that can be really tricky. They can do something that really, um, really interferes with IH and IH can do something that really interferes with some kind of zoning tool that they're looking at. So we're definitely um, coordinating on those efforts. Yeah, and I wasn't uh, suggesting that you weren't. We um, we had Carl Geiler come to our last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, some of this, some of the information he gave it was almost like a teaser in that regard. And <laughs> I thought, well, it's, there's some good thought heading in the right direction. We'd love to hear more of that. Mark. So I want to second all the praise for <clears throat> the presentation. I've been waiting for years to kind of uh, have something like this. Uh, I've only been on a planning board for a year, but but in, in other uh, circles to under help understand uh, the breadth and depth of our inclusionary housing ordinance. So th that was really great. So um, I'm going to make a statement and then two two questions. Um, the statement is, I, I, it seems like we can all agree that affordable housing is good and more affordable housing is even better. And the, the first question is, if I understood the slide correctly, our current regs seem to incentivize fewer units and larger units at the, at the lower end of those number of units. And I, I don't understand why we would do that. So can you, you know, give me your best guess as to why we have, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, incentivize fewer units and larger units. Mark, can you can you clarify for me why why you think that's the case? Like what tool is is <clears throat> okay go if if you Go back to the slide that, well, for instance, we um, don't, we cap the inclusionary housing um, fund requirements or requirements at 12 or 1300 feet. So if I build a 6,000 square foot uh, single family home, it's treated the same as a, what, I forget what the number was, but a, a smaller uh, unit. And, and, we, and we treat a smaller number of units in a gentler, easier fashion than, a, than the five or more units. So, uh, yeah. you know, so, okay. so it's kind of like we're being deferential to larger units, larger, fewer units than a developer that says, hey, I wanna build 20 units and small compact and so forth. And, and by using a unit designation and then by having um, the cap of the adjustment be in the low uh, tens of hundreds, um, we're, 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 we're giving people building three and four and 5,000 square foot units a bit of a free ride. Right. So, I, so, um, so those are two updates that we're addressing. Um, historically, why, why that was done, um, it's sort of interesting. I mean, I wasn't around. I was probably a okay. teenager. Um, maybe not a teenager, but I wasn't around when the program was adopted. Um, there were concessions made from the city to the development community so they wouldn't oppose the adoption of the program. Okay. One of them was, we will not penalize larger units. And that's how that 1200, th this is the, the urban myth that was told to me. I, I, I can't confirm that it's true or not, but this is the explanation that I've always understood it to be. 
that um, you know it was a it was a concession. There was a number of concessions made to get the program adopted originally, um, and um, one of them was to not penalize larger units. Well, that's probably run its course and lived its course. And at, of course, back then in the year two thousand, huge huge homes. You know, the, the the home sizes were smaller, so it made more. You know, there was a little bit more logic to it. Um, so one of the things we're definitely looking at, at in the update, as I explained in the slides, is is actually removing that cap and saying, you know, that that, that isn't serving us anymore, and now we need to rethink that. Okay. Um, the other one is that, um, um, and, and I don't know that we're going to, so the other one is that there's a 20% requirement on one to four units, including single family homes. It's a lighter requirement. Um, and that was a desire of the council. And I, I was there. I did, I've done all the major updates. So, so I did the 20, 2009, the two, 2018, and now. <clears throat> um, and the, the discussion that council had at that time was we, we want to keep IH on a single family home, but we really want it to be a lower amount. We, 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 we want to make sure we're not, you know, um, impacting the development of single family homes. So, so there was, it was just a different time and a different desire for what they wanted for the outcome. So, so we split up that table and we put a, a smaller amount of cash and lieu on the one to four units and, you know, that's, okay. that's what was so, adopted. And, and there was a, there was a, you know, rationale behind it, but it's probably again served its purpose and maybe we need to rethink it. So okay. can I just add on to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So just to expand on Michelle, I mean, I, I, I know where you're going, Mark. I mean, I don't, but my opinion is I don't think inclusionary housing is what's driving larger units and fewer of them. Um, I think it's the zoning code. A developer doesn't show up at the, you know, they, they're not, that devious, they're not looking at the the cash and lieu table to figure out. Oh, I pay slightly less cash and lieu if I do larger, fewer, larger units. Um, I would say it's our open space requirements. It's everything else that's driving that. IH is just icing on the cake, I would say, and and we are working to address that. But don't think that simply by changing IH, we're going to change um, what developers build. Right. Great. I, that, both of those answers are really helpful. I, I will say, yes, it, it's, if it's icing on the cake, but, you know, you add icing in the, the middle layer and, some, you know, you, if, if you, anyway, it can all add up to potentially a different result. Um, the, the next question is, and I think this is more pertinent to today, if I read uh, this council correctly and community activists and so forth. Um, we still hold out on-site units as being so far superior to uh, off-site or cash in lieu that we not only have great incentives now for on-site units, we're talking about increasing those which if you, if you do the math would actually result in fewer affordable units. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, are, are, are we, what is the, in, in a city like Boulder where we don't have large expanses of blighted areas or really areas that are highly undesirable that someone could um, do an offsite or cash and lieu development when we, if you take just looking at Boulder and not Chicago or something like that, uh, why do we hold uh, on-site units to such a level of superiority that it results in substantially fewer uh, affordable units being built? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think you framed it. Well, Mark, I mean, it's a policy question. And I think in the past that there has been a strong community sentiment that cash in lieu is bad, um, offsite is bad, um, that true integration is what the program was intended, intended for. And that was the case, but we were getting ownership at the time um, with, with the shift to rental, with everything else that we talked about in the presentation. I think it's a valid question for council and for, um, these both for you guys is what is the greater benefit 
more units or on site. Okay. Okay. All right. Mark, Great. I think uh, that that is a, an excellent topic for further discussion among the board as well. So yep. I, I hope that we can have a coherent discussion on those issues. I'm All right, great. Well, thanks thanks for indulging me and in, in answering as best you could. Yeah, and, and, and I would add, Mark, that, you know, the program, because of the way it's legally um, positioned and, and was adopted, the legal, uh, you know, um, foundation of the program, there, ha there always has to be a unit alternative. We have to we have to offer that to a developer. We have to say, you can provide units or you can provide money. We can't go to a pure um, scheme where it's just like, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we want that to work as, as well as it can. Right, well, it, in fact, if one could make the case that it works so well that we get three or four units uh, in the market, that are affordable for every one unit that would be located on site. Mm -hmm. So if I, I, I just I, I I hope that when that when this is presented to planning board and council and we make our our recommendations and council votes on it, that it's really weighed as is an on site unit four times the value of an off site unit still located within the city. Because that, to me, that is what's uh, what's being shown as we get three to four offsite offsite uh, units using cash in lieu for every unit that that would if we adhere to the goal of integrated onsite units. Anyway, uh, it's a valid topic for discussion. I think let's move on. Laura. Thank you. Um, I want to also support the thanks to staff for a really informative and great presentation. I'm sure I will go back and watch it and refer to it and pull up the slides. Um, so much information. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Sloan, for an excellent presentation. I have so many questions. <laughs> so I'm really glad we're having this discussion. I will limit myself to just a couple for now, like Philip did, and maybe we'll come back around. Um, just following up on what Mark is saying, I, I think I'm hearing that, uh, you know, you showed a slide saying council gave you a goal, and that goal was to increase middle income opportunities. And part of the way that that has translated is into this inclusionary housing program, which does provide middle income uh, uh, affordable opportunities, um, but it's translated into middle income on site ownership three components and and it's not clear to me from looking at the council meeting in November where Bob was questioning it Nicole was questioning it Matt Benjamin was questioning it there was a lot of discussion about like is this the right tool is this what we really want to focus on is this should this be the focus of our efforts and I know that we want to kind of narrow down in this conversation to just talking about the inclusionary housing program because that's other things are on the table too like occupancy ADUs zoning reforms all of that will get talked about. But even in just this conversation around inclusionary housing, you know, I was really intrigued by something that Michelle mentioned that, you know, in, um, the inclusionary housing can be used to support priorities like transitional housing, permanently supportive housing, senior housing. And it's not clear to me that council considered all of that and said, no, the thing that we really need to focus our inclusionary housing program on is including is increasing opportunities for middle income, affordable on-site housing above everything else that we could be doing with this money. Like I am all 100% in favor. I think your ideas are fabulous for increasing the pie, right? Increasing the pot of money through um, increasing the inclusionary housing fees on teardowns and rebuilds that are much larger um, and, and that kind of thing. You had like a list of things that you're, changes that you're considering. I think these are wonderful ways to get more money into this program. My question is just about whether I hope that this body and HAB and council will have a robust conversation around what really is the number one and number two priority for how we use that increased pot of funds, because it's not a zero sum game exactly, but it really is if, if we're really going to focus our efforts on increasing middle income ownership opportunities. A lot of resources are going to go towards that above and beyond what some of our other priorities might be so so that's kind of a comment, but the question I guess in that is. Am I missing something? Like, was there a conversation at City Council where they said, 
we really need to focus on not just middle income and use this tool for it, but middle income ownership on site opportunities. Can you point me to that? I can give you a little bit more context, maybe that might help. Um, no, I think you're, you're spot on with your sort of your um, perceptions and analysis. So this has been the biggest nut to crack. And, you know, every jurisdiction across the country is struggling with this, I would argue. And it started back in 2017 when city council adopted the middle income housing strategy. Um, and what the big outcome from community surveys and whatnot is that when people want who are renting in Boulder um, wanted to make that transition to ownership, felt that they had to leave Boulder to find something that was affordable. And so trying to retain sort of that um, more of that middle um, because the barbells were growing. We were doing really well with low and moderate income. The, the wealthy were doing just fine with housing in Boulder. It was that middle that was getting squeezed out. It has all sorts of implications for our school district, for um, you know the diversity of our socioeconomic diversity of our city. So I think that's where the fixation came from and the desire to try to address this problem. Um, and staff, we've been trying to be responsive. So like we talked about, we adopted those tools in 2018, created more incentives. Um, I think part of what we want to go back to council with um, is these are still the huge challenges. That's why we are when at that slide. We still have all these big challenges. We, we haven't figured out exactly how to do it. And we're not entirely confident that we're gonna, but by simply increasing the incentives that we're gonna somehow magically get more ownership. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't still keep trying. Does that help at all? That is helpful, thank you. I think we're all struggling with it. Um, it, it clearly, help, having people leave Boulder because they want to buy a house is not the ideal outcome. Um, and, and so that is that is helpful to see where that thinking has come from and why staff are trying to be responsive to that. I, I still have questions about whether it would be our number one priority for how we spend the additional inclusionary housing money that we might be able to increase the pie by. I think we should still have a conversation about that, but it's really helpful to have that, that piece of information. Thank you. I'll stop there and let others take a turn. Okay, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, guys, for a great presentation. Um, I, I have uh, three questions. I will just put them out there, and you can answer them at at your leisure. Um, the first is: Is there any discussion of increasing the annual percentage of appreciation that's allowed in the for for future for sale options? I have heard from a couple of people, not a lot, that the very um, small appreciation uh, that's allowed um is a sort of a disincentive uh to um home ownership in these um in the few but hopefully more um affordable ih uh, for sale units so that's question number one M my second question has to do with is there um a value in um an updated housing choice survey. Uh, our last one was 2014. That was, I think, for in commuters in 2015 was missing middle or maybe it's turned around the other way. But it's 10 years, almost 10 years later, and a lot has changed. And I'm just wondering if as we think through the incentives related to the specific slice of the inclusionary housing program, whether having um, updated housing choice information might be valuable. Um, and then my third question, and this I think this is a secondary question to this particular conversation, is how would new um, IH um, regs apply to the East Boulder subcommunity plan, since that has a lot of um, units that could come online in the, in the near-ish future? I'm just sort of curious what the implications or impacts might be. Those were my three questions. Answer them at your leisure. Um, okay, I can do that. Um, so the first one, the annual appreciation. So the um, the reason be why we have uh, limited the appreciation for permanently affordable homeownership homes um, is so that 
because the idea is that home is supposed to be affordable in perpetuity, right? So future um, residents in 50, 100 years have to be able to afford that. So it's tied to income. Um, that And that's what um, ensures that it remains affordable over time. So if we had a higher appreciation rate, we wouldn't be serving the same income levels as we um, currently do. Jay, uh, would, that be, would that be true even if it was just a 1% increase in hmm. the... I'm just sort of, I don't, I'm sure you guys have done the, the run the numbers, but. Yeah, I mean, so 1% doesn't seem like much, but if you do 1% compounded every single year in 50 years, that, that home is not going to be affordable to anybody. Um, so, but there are other options. So as Michelle talked about, and I, and I know exactly who you've been talking to because they're not happy being in the program. Um, but it's really not intended to be a, a lifetime solution to everybody. So the average tenure for our homes is, is seven years. A lot of people take that opportunity to purchase the home, to build equity, to get that down payment, to be able to purchase in the market. That doesn't work for everybody. Um, but uh, And we do have people that stay longer as well. Um, but they still, you know, there are lots of folks that if you, we did a survey, the last, last survey we did, nine out of 10 people said they would purchase a home again in the, in the program. Um, and, you know, a similar percentage said that their financial stability had um, dramatically increased um, as a result of purchasing their home. So there are lots of benefits, um, but the, the appreciation rate, and we're going to talk about this as part of the down payment assistance pilot, uh, March 2nd with council. Um, yeah. Uh, and the, sorry, the one other thing I want to mention, so there are also um, allowances for capital improvements. So it's, it's not limited to just the cap. You, you can make improvements. So say you swap out your carpets to hardwood floors. Um, there are allowances for that. So that would increase your, um, your future sales price and your overall appreciation over time. Um, does that answer your question, Sarah, the first one? Okay. Um, Sort of a new, new survey, we uh, have hey, not- Jay, I'm sorry, just for clarification yeah. for Please. around, um, you, you mentioned trying to keep parity at wage growth. Mm -hmm. My understanding of the nominal growth per year nationwide, and I don't know what it is for Boulder, is around 5%. So I guess that's my question. What you said, and, and also we've hit CPI and inflation, all those things. So I- yep. I guess to Sarah's point, whether or not 2% is the right number, um, I, I think it may be worthwhile just to understand that a little bit better um, because things are changing rapidly, both through inflationary things and CPI, as well as wage growth. And so um, if we're trying to tie it to wage growth, um, I, I don't know that 2% is tied to wage growth. Um, yeah. So anyways, just just a just a point um, to, of clarity. Yep, no, I appreciate that. And yeah, and I was overly simplistic. So it's a combination of of area median income as well as the consumer price index. Um, so there there is a formula that we use. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't be re reviewed. Um, my I guess my only point was that it has served us well, but I, your point is well taken that with particularly with the significantly um, high interest rates of the last couple of years. I, I think it is worthwhile. Um, and we are just now building capacity in the home ownership team, but I think that is something that we could undertake in the next year or two. Um, and yeah, we, we have heard it from others, but I just wanted to give you the background of why we, the, the, why we cap it. And, um, but how, where we cap it at is, is certainly up for debate. Um, so in terms of doing a new housing choice survey, um, we, we haven't budgeted for that um, and don't have any immediate intentions. My guess is uh, we would hear a lot of the same things that we hear now um, or that we heard back in 2016. Um, and so not to say that we might not learn something new, but we're still trying to sort of implement uh, the policies that we have and we're, we're still trying to climb out of that resource constrained environment. Um, surveys are really nice. Boulder's really good at studying issues and doing surveys. Um, so we're, we're, 
but um, at this point, we don't have any plans to do that. Uh, but that could change. And then the new regs for the East Boulder uh, area. So basically, once they, um, and Sloan can probably talk better than you guys know except more about when it would apply. So once those regular regs are effective, and Michelle said for a quarter of this year, um, that's when they, that's when a new uh, application comes in. That's what applies at that time. Does that help answer your question, Sarah? Uh, yes, and I guess I'd ask Sloan what, I, I'm, I'm kind of asking you to do this on the fly, but would that mean 25% of the whatever is developed, whatever units are developed in East Boulder would be uh, in the permanently affordable uh, pot? Yeah, so I know there's a lot of language in the area plan about sort of maximizing affordable housing, especially in certain areas. Um, but at this point in the planning process, it hasn't actually been uh, codified in the land use code. I, I know they're looking at possibly like creating a new zoning district. Um, so it's that hasn't happened yet. So if something were to develop in the next year or two, the standard IH requirements would apply. But I think the vision is to sort of increase opportunities for affordable housing. So hypothetically, it would be higher than that 25% if it's on site or you know, the cash and loop payment. Okay, let's see, uh, Angela. Um, I wanted to make a comment um, regarding the fourth quarter end of year for 2022, because the statistics look a little different than they were in 21, even though 21 on a sales side was very robust because of COVID. So in the city of Boulder, um, at the end of this past year, 24% um, of the homes that sold were 2 million and above, and 59% of the homes that sold were between one and 2 million. So that's 83% of our home sales exceeded a million dollars. So the pie is rapidly shrinking for folks who are just trying to stay and trying to buy into town at or under a million dollars. So. I think revisions to the IH program are really welcomed and we really need them. So that was just comment number one. And then um, I had kind of a question for, I guess, Jay and, and well, and Sloan and Michelle, when you're looking at formulating changes to the IH policy, I'm just curious, does demographic data in terms of the generations at play, you know, the home ownership groups coming in now is, are the millennials, they're roughly 28 to 42. They're in their home buying years. Does that play into how you look at, you know, what opportunities you're trying to create and, and what kind of product types you're trying to create? I'm just curious and just asking. Uh, I can uh, um, attempt to, to answer that. So Angela, the way IH um, has been developed and put in place, and it's true of all the programs around the country, the, the program produces a subset of whatever the market produces mm -hmm. and the market takes all that into account with their market studies right and then they decide what product they think is going to be you know most uh, well first of all what what is it they want to build and what uh, what can they then sell or rent so mm -hmm. ih doesn't really draw isn't really driven in that way it, if 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 their market studies compel them to build micro units, IH gets some micro units, mm -hmm. right? So it's really uh, uh, the development community that decides what the product should be based on their market studies. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, and then Pardon, my last Pardon, does that, does that include BHP when BHP develops its own product or Thistle or Habitat for Humanity? Like, are they doing market studies or what are they mm -hmm. relying on when they do their products? They are definitely doing market studies. As a matter of fact, they're required by their banks because they all have loans. Um, and so market studies are pretty much required and you have to just show that there's an adequate mar market for whatever. So BHP is different. They're doing a hybrid. They're trying to do meet um, what the market study says is a, a desirable product in the community and meet city goals and build things that, you know, they, they um, confer with us. Um, 
uh, for what what we we're interpreting as uh, city goals and what council wants and um, what the comp plan is looking for and that that type of thing. So so BHP is straddling in the middle. Um, as far as the product, you know, as, and that's more like they're trying to meet, meet city goals for who they serve. And the product is what their market study says the product should be, you know, <laughs> I you. mean, so, so they're a different animal. Um, they're, they're definitely a different animal. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting Angela. Oh, no, that's fine. And I just had one more comment and I just know this because I sold property in town for a long time. When Markel and Coast to Coast, I think Markel brought the um, annexation in um, out in uh, Northfield Common. So that's Northeast Boulder. Um, the folks know where Northfield Common, Common is. So, and Michelle, you can jump in here at any time. 36 townhomes were built for the middle income, you know, ownership program. And I can't remember, there's three streets. Ure is one of them. And then there's two other streets. And the product type was brilliant because people never move. Those units hardly ever come on the market. And some of those units or many of those units have original owners and they're probably 20 years old now. So it, it, it's just an example of building a neighborhood and the right product and the product was flexible to townhome, three, you know, two beds, two baths up, um, a basement that was able to be built out with another bathroom and a garage and people love them so it, yeah you know. so i would just clarify angela that's a good good observation they're beautiful homes out there yeah. um and that was annexation so when an annexation is negotiated it's not ih it, it's staff trying to interpret um, what we think council is looking for in annexation and looking for in a housing community benefit Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit different um, because we have a lot of control in a, in an annexation. We don't have, um, you know, like uh, I, I said with um, with IH, it's a subset of whatever the market is producing. In an annexation, we can go in and say, you might want to do single family homes, but we want duplexes because we think because that controls some, for affordability. Um, you know, for whatever reasons, we might say we want this other product type. We can do that in an annexation. We can't do it in IH. Right. Uh, we can't say you're, oh, you're going to build apartments. Well, you know, now you're going to build some duplexes. We can't do that in, in, in IH, but in annexation, we do, and we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually our current um, sort of rules of thumb for negotiating exam annexation is the affordable price <coughs> will not be a single family home because we don't think council is looking for a bunch of uh, um, single family homes at this point through annexations. They wanna get more housing and more affordable housing. So um, often we will say, whatever you build in an annexation um, has to be a, some kind of attached product. See, I'm trying to give everyone a chance here before repeating, Lisa. Yeah, um, I think this got touched on and I apologize. I was having some internet connectivity issues. Um, I don't wanna jump the gun. So I'll just say um, that I'm very curious to hear what a little bit perhaps about what might be going to council in terms of down payment assistance program because when I think about missing middle, I think about preserving um, you know, existing middle income housing as opposed to building new because that's a lot more affordable. And then I also think about how do we subsidize people to actually be able to purchase homes who, who might be more than affording the mortgage payment already, depending on what they're paying in rent, um, but who cannot scrape together, you know, that much for down payment. Um, so yeah, it, it may have been touched on what, while I was um, having some issues. So I just want to acknowledge that we may have already touched on that, but I would appreciate a, a quick um, recap of that or covering of that if we didn't get to get into it too much. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, yeah, and I didn't really cover all the different tools that we have for um, middle in acquiring middle income. So um, there's the pilot that's coming up March 2nd. Council will discuss it in more detail and we'll go into the, the, the different tools that we have currently in more detail just for context for council at that meeting. But primarily we have a down payment assistance program currently. It's called Home to Ownership, H2O. Um, where we provide up to $100,000 down payment for um, a home. We, we do not require a deed restriction, um, but we um, when, when they go to sell, uh, um, they basically have to provide us 
a share of the appreciation. So it's an evergreen fund. So we get that money back and we can loan it out to a new household. That's been relatively successful. We've probably had a you know, couple dozen people participate. Uh, the other is we started purchasing units on the open market, um, buying them down. Basically, sometimes we have to do a little bit of rehab um, and then reselling them uh, to middle income homeowner, homeowners. And that subsidy is anywhere between you know, $100,000 and um, closer to $200,000. Those we do deed restrict because we buy them down um, and that home remains affordable in perpetuity. Um, so those are two different tools. And then the pilot that's gonna be discussed by council is kind of a, an interesting hybrid of the two where we're gonna provide a down payment assistance. Um, the homeowner is gonna pay that back, um, but in exchange, they're also gonna accept a deed restriction. Um, so it, it's a it's definitely a different animal. It's a little more complex. Um, and so that's what we need to check in with council on. What are the right parameters? And appreciation is one of those big questions. What is the appropriate appreciation rate? So yeah, so there are other tools out there and that's part of this whole discussion. Um, but again, it's not, IH is one of those many tools and that's sort of our approach for affordable housing. How many different tools can we have in the toolbox? And let me ask just one other um, follow-up question. How is that program communicated or advertised? Like how do people learn that they could take advantage of it? I mean, I, I know that if I go and I like Google down payment assistance folder, right? That it'll come up, but how, how else do people learn that that's even something they could take advantage of? Yeah, we, we've been working on that a lot. Um, actually, this just the past few months that we changed some of the parameters. So the H2O program, the shared appreciation, um, if you made it to page 17 on your annual letter from the city, from the city, it, it was there, it was a full page ad, um, trying to entice people. Um, so, and, and we have gotten one person since then. So it, it worked, we got one, um, but it, 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 it is kind of challenging. And we, so we've tried to work with local realtors, but if anyone has suggestions on how to get that word out, we have a nice handy flyer um we do you know we, we've done social media you might have seen it probably not but um it's competing with a lot of other things that, that are out there thank you okay i think uh i'll jump in with a question here too i think we've made a full round now um i was wondering if you could uh embroider a little bit on the on the pro on the land banking program that I think Michelle mentioned as one of the options for uh, uh, that that developers have available to them just to provide some sort of equivalent value of land that then either is automatically goes to older housing partners or could be retained by the city for other purposes too I suppose if they decided to. Can you describe a little bit more how that works and yeah, how? I sure can. Yeah. Um, so the land does need to be used to produce affordable housing. It can't be used for other because it's part of the IH code. Um, and it says the land to be de to be dedicated um, for the production of affordable housing um, that conforms to the IH kind of code parameters. Um, so essentially the way it works and we've only ever had two so we don't have a lot of experience um but they we uh, basically they propose a piece of land we have some criteria for the land it's got to be a clean title it's got to be free of environmental uh, you know contamination that kind of thing so there are some parameters in the code of what the land can look like it's up to the city manager to decide whether the land is acceptable or not it gets appraised um, and then that value is, um, we take a look at that value as compared to the cash in lieu that the project would owe. If the land is not equal to the cash in lieu amount, they pay the difference. If it exceeds, we'll still take your land, the land. <laughs> we won't give you anything back. Um, it's never gonna be exactly right. So typically you're gonna see a piece of land being donated that's gonna be less than the cash and lieu amount required and then they'll make up the difference in cash and lieu. And then it's land is banked. Again, the city does not hold on to it. We dedicate it to BHP. And that's again, that's part of the land dedication, um, part of the code. So it's dedicated to our, um, uh, you know, a, a a developer of our choice, but the the market developer does not get to decide who who 
the land goes to. That's up to the city. But they dedicate it to us, and we just dedicate it right on to BHP. And then um, they will develop it when they have the capacity. Um, it will probably, so there are some things about that land dedication that we're going to propose some um, updates to the code. Um, because right now there's a little bit of a disconnect because we probably would have to put money into that project. The, the delta of that cash and loo will probably not be enough to, to develop a project on that land. So we need to sort of look at that and decide what that should really look like. And um, yeah, so then eventually BHP holds it. They're holding a number of parcels of land right now um, for future development and, and sort of feeding them into the development queue as um, they have capacity or it makes sense, uh, they would develop a project on it. So, so so does it have to be a piece of land that BHP is actually eventually interested in developing or could they just own it and, and flip it, uh, you know, uh, and use the funds for, for some other purpose that they want to do? I, I don't think it would be in the, um, the um, int you know the the code is written that it, it needs to be developed according to um, you know in conformance with IH. So no, I don't think that it would be okay to just flip that land. But that's something the whole land piece needs to be tightened up a little bit. And again, we've only ever done two. Mount Calvary was a land mm -hmm. dedication from Fraser Meadows, and then we have Diagonal Plaza that is doing a land dedication. So. We've learned a lot from those two land dedications and have ideas on, but there's, it's not a policy change at all. It's just sort of some tightening up of that land dedication code language. Well, I, no, I, they, they can't take it and flip it. Matter of fact, they sign. So when, when the land is dedicated, it, it, we don't even, it doesn't even pass through us. It goes directly from the developer to BHP, but, we but then we execute a land dedication agreement with BHP because we're not just giving them land right? Um, there's an agreement and it says you must use this land for X, Y, and Z. Um, right. Yeah. Does BHP have the opportunity then to reject a piece of land that they think is unsuitable for development? Uh, yeah, I think they could. Yeah. So it's BHP's decision. It's, it's no. not- No. Well, I mean, we would definitely talk, you know, so again, we've had two in 20, 23 years, <laughs> um, but in, in both cases, you know, we talked to BHP, is, is, a, is it, you know, is this a piece of land that is, you know, that is attractive and that you can do a project on, and again, it was Mount Calvary, which is going to be a beautiful project, a senior housing project, and then Diagonal um, Plaza, so that'll be rental, so yeah, we definitely we we confer with them and we probably the city would reject the land if bhp said listen um housing and human services this is not a good piece of land you okay know? so that's yeah. my question. they're kind yeah. of they, they would kind of advise us on that yeah for sure okay. mm -hmm. all right okay michael Excuse me, I'll see to one of the Dan's because I've already commented, although I would like to comment again after they're done. Oh, all right. Laura. Oh, I think uh, Dan Rotner was in line before oh, me. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, uh, Dan. Uh, I, okay. I didn't stand up there. Yeah. Okay. That, thank you, everybody. I um, Just uh, those of you who don't know me, I, I have been a member of the TRG since... Uh, uh, I think it's 2013 when I first started. Uh, so it's been a little bit. I think I'm wrapping up my tenure on that um, on the on the group. But a couple of comments here because I, I just first of all I want to say it's it, the staff uh, at Housing Division. I mean the challenges of assessing these funding applications they're extraordinarily complex. They're often uh, delivered under tremendous time pressure and. Uh, and I, I found just what my takeaway over the time on the board is that, and this also ties to some of the commentary, I think Laura made commentary earlier on how the funding that goes into the, into the pot um, uh, for the catch and loo, how it's allocated. The, assessing the relative merits of these different applications is extraordinarily difficult because they tend to be very diverse. I mean, you have, you'll have, uh, a Habitat for Humanity project next to uh, permanently supportive housing, next to rehab funding, and 
understanding just in terms of the scoring of these different applications relative to overall policy objectives in the city of Boulder, I think that's very difficult. And, and I think staff is, does an admirable job at sorting through all this information and providing recommendations. They do, I mean, I think they provide great information, but as I said, to say, all right, we're trying to promote middle income housing, making sure that the cash and loop funding is allocated according to those overall policy objectives. I think you really need to try and have some sort of a scoring system uh, to allow that uh, more objective assessment of the relative merits um, of the different applications. Um, you've got some very, I think, very worthy um, nonprofits and uh, working in Boulder and their ability to present these applications is, uh, you know, they're organized to do this. It's what they do. They've uh, applied for grant funding. Um, it, and sometimes it's, I think, going to be a matter I mean, one of the challenges for staff and for from a policy standpoint, how do you say no to a really worthy and needy uh, nonprofit who's dealing with one issue when the targets of the uh, overall policy uh, shaped by, by uh, the city council are going in a different direction. So that's just uh, my brief comment. And I just had one quick follow-up question from very early on in this, uh, in this discussion. The, on the ADUs, there are incentives for a permanently affordable ADU. And I'm curious how, what the uptake has been in terms of uh, how many ADUs have been delivered under that incentive program? Is that something that's worked, or uh, you know, the desire to get more ADUs? Maybe that's uh, that could be potentially low-hanging fruit to change the shape of that program in a way that would increase the appeal. Because uh, I think a lot of the, I don't think people give up a lot in terms of rent necessarily when they create an ADU that meets the. Uh, the uh, AMI guidelines, um, but I think there's some complications in the uh, in the program that make it less desirable than it might otherwise be. Anyway, that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Great question. Um, so council just last Thursday uh, had a study session on it and the latest ADU updates. So, uh, and so if you really want to know more, they did a great job of explaining how the program works. But just very quickly, so um, the affordable ADUs are not uh, permanently affordable. They're not deed restricted. Uh, what a homeowner does is they sign a declaration of use, agreeing that they will not um, rent uh, the, afford the unit for more than 80% um, AMI. So they basically agree to charging um, a certain rent level. Um, so they do that in exchange typically for not uh, having to provide on site parking space for the ADU uh, to get a slightly larger size. And there, so it's basically built in as uh, um, we wanted to provide more flexibility for the construction of an ADU, but in exchange, we wanted to make sure those rents are affordable in the long term. Um, I would say it's been fairly successful. I don't have the exact number, but I was surprised. Um, I want to say it's close to half or I can't remember which way. Uh, are of the new units that have been built since the regulations have been adopted uh, are considered affordable. Um, but keep in mind, it doesn't mean that they have to rent it. So it just means that they have to agree that if they do rent it, that it'll be at that affordable rate. So I think council will be interested in continuing that um, as well. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit more of it. If you want more of the last Thursday study session, it's a great resource. See, Michael. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't have questions because, again, the staff did such a great job. They answered all of my questions during their presentation. So, more comments, I'm afraid. Um, this gets back to what Mark McIntyre was talking about a little bit in two respects. Uh, you know, I think you could summarize a lot of this conversation by saying uh, we're getting a lot of housing that we don't necessarily want and not enough of what we don't want. Um, and, I, and I'm really encouraged to see um, discussion of uh, the, the very large home issue because that has an effect on neighborhood character as well as affordability. Um, so uh, again, um, if there are uh, zoning amendments that can be considered that would allow some lots to be split in a way that also incorporated IH, I think that's 
uh, worth uh, further discussion. Um, also really appreciated Angela bringing up um, Northfield Commons and uh, demonstrating the benefits of uh, looking at larger parcels of sea controlled land and if we can be creative and maybe we can find more of those in the future to create more uh, middle income housing. Um, so I don't think the on-site affordable and the off-site cash and lieu housing are mutually exclusive that you know we should be pursuing um, all, the, all the tools we have to create diversity in housing types in various locations. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Laura. Thanks, John. Is it okay to be more on the comment end of things rather than the question end, or do you want me to save um, comments for later? I, I would prefer to save our comments for later. So let's focus on the questions now, and then we get another round with comments, maybe after a break. Okay, I will lower my hand then. Thank you. Okay. Sarah. I also have comments, so I'll lower my hand till later. Okay, man. Okay, let's take a five minute break and come back with being ready to share your wisdom here. So we'll start again at 827.
I guess I'm the first one back, but I'm not going to soapbox it anymore. <laughs> well, now it's your chance. <laughs> but uh, I was just thinking with respect to, to Daniel's questions, it was a, a pity he wasn't at the HAB meeting last week where a lot of those numbers were presented also. Um, John, if I may, I'd like yeah. to ask staff, there's a visual that may help me with some of my comments. Oh. Um, if you are able to pull it up, it was not in the presentation tonight, but it was in the presentation that you gave to city council back in, I think it was October 24th or something like that. There was a slide that talked about how much it costs the city to produce middle income housing by various methods, like how much injection of city cash you have to do to do a to buy a unit and then resell it at a lower price or there were like three different options with different price points for the city. I don't know if you're able to find that for when we start back up. I could try to find it too. I'm pulling up the presentation so. Okay, thank you so much. Sloan. Find that for you. Yeah. You know where it is, Sloan? If you don't, let me know. Well, I've got the deck so I can imagine. It's in there. I'll find it. Jay, do you know which slide I'm talking about? Sloan, do you know which slide I'm talking about? Yep, I know exactly which one. Okay, that's very impressive. If you can bring that up so quickly, that's nice. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm trying to figure out are we all back here? Um, <clears throat> I think we are. No? We have Lisa. Yeah, Lisa. Well, Lisa isn't in her picture yet. Mark, Daniel, ML are still not showing their faces. So if they're here, please oh. let us know. All right, we'll give them another minute and then we get going again. Okay, here's here's at least somebody. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so Laura, your hand was up first, but are, do you want to wait for that uh, slide to appear before you talk or do, sure, are I you can ready? Wait. I can wait. Okay. Sarah, do you want to go first? Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. All right. Thanks. Um, so a couple comments. Um, I, I, I'm a little concerned that there's a slight misunderstanding of what it is that's what city council has asked staff to do they haven't asked staff to rejigger the entire ih program so it's about mid middle income housing they're asking them to um revive review and revise the slice of the ih program that's for um for sale um affordable middle income housing I, I just feel like there's been a slight piece of, uh, just a little bit of, um, I don't want, it's not misinformation, it's just in, in, in it's inaccurate description of what it is that I think staff is working on. So, um, and to that point, I really like Daniel Rotner's suggestion of some very clear um, criteria, uh, 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 he used the term um, scoring system. Um, that would give um, the folks who are on um, the um, technical advisory board uh, some some very clear common criteria that will allow them to uh, effectively balance all of these competing projects. And maybe, uh, so I think if staff can think about something that will um, a lot, give them that, a tool that will help them so that they can um, find the right balance of very low income um, rentals, uh, low to moderate rentals, and this slice that is 
uh, for sale um, that I think would be a very valuable addition to um, the toolkit for the city. Um, and I personally think that this is a very important slice of the, what we're talking about tonight is a very important slice of the IH program. Um, we've talked for many years now about the sort of dumbbell effect of we have housing at the low end, we have housing at the high end, and we don't have a ton in the middle. And this is one of those efforts to get more of that. So I really appreciate that we are having this conversation and that council has, has focused on this. Those were my comments. Okay, Laura, you ready? Yes, thank you. Um, and I have a few, and I might forget some. So um, hope, hopefully, I'll cover what I want to. Um, so I apologize if I've misunderstood the focus of what this update is. My understanding was that staff is looking at the inclusionary housing program for its third update, and that a major focus of this update is trying to increase the production of for sale middle income housing as opposed to anything else that you could be focusing on with this update. So if I have misunderstood that, um, I apologize, but I do understand that you're not gonna take the whole pie and shift it. Um, it's just, it is looking at that slice and how you can increase it is, that's what I thought I understood from the staff memo. Um, so I, like Sarah, I, I do agree with the suggestion for clear scoring criteria for the TRG to help with how to understand when they have all of these different competing needs in front of them, like transitional housing, supportive housing, halfway housing, senior housing, low income housing, middle income housing kinds of projects, how they would weigh those against each other for the available funding. Um, and that's for that funding piece, although I think staff are also looking at some developer incentives for what's required when we do a site review project, for example. Um, I, I do want to caution, so I did read the memo about the use of the racial equity instrument, and it looks like the racial equity instrument kind of slightly maybe punted on the question of whether increasing the share of funding that goes to middle income housing might have a disproportionate racial in, impact as compared to taking that funding and using it for low income, low to moderate income um, housing, uh, you know. I don't have the demographic figures in front of me and income by by racial breakdown, but my basic understanding is that uh, racial and ethnic minorities tend to be disproportionately represented the lower that you go in the income slices or tranches. Um, and so I do have some concern that if we are shifting resources or taking our expanded pie of resources and dedicating it towards middle income housing, I think we need to acknowledge that 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 is perhaps not the most the best way to use those funds to boost up racial equity in Boulder. Middle income home buyers are probably disproportionately white. So that's not to say we shouldn't do it. That's not to say it's not an important goal. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves and how we are using our funding and what is the racial impact, we should talk about that. Um, so I, I don't want us to sort of glide over that. And just say, well, any increase in affordable housing is a is a good thing for racial equity. Um, because I guarantee you, not everybody is looking at it that way. Um, mostly with these comments, I want to think about or talk about some of the things I have heard that staff could be considering in this update, um, specifically about inclusionary housing that I think are really good ideas. And I haven't yet heard them uh, a signal boost for these particular ideas, and so I want to signal boost them. One is one thing that Lauren Folkerts mentioned at the city council meeting back in October was the idea of um, not just when you scrape and rebuild a house larger, but if you're just adding a, a big addition onto your house, if you're taking a single family home and making it larger, perhaps significantly larger, that is not currently subject to inclusionary housing uh, uh, fees, as I understand it, and it perhaps could be. So I think that's something that she suggested taking a look at, and I think is worth taking a look at. Um, Aaron talked about another of Lauren's ideas um, that one thing that the city could do to encourage um, on-site inclusionary housing is that if a small project is meeting the inclusionary housing uh, on-site, that it could be done by right and not have to come through site review, um, which I think is another idea worth taking a look at. Like, how do we give people a break on the site review process if they are meeting what we really want in our goals for inclusionary housing. 
So that's another idea I wanted to boost. And then something else somewhat related to this discussion, hopefully related, you know, Nicole brought up that Nicole um, Spear in the city council meeting brought up that one of the reasons why people want home ownership opportunities is because that is one of the major equity building tools. It's generational wealth building. It's um, in addition to the stability and the freedom to be creative with your own home and what that that means in terms of your embeddedness in a community and your pride in your community. But one major reason why people want home ownership is to build wealth. And I don't know if, if the city has considered or looked at um, you know, are there things that we can do for people that are in our inclusionary housing, our affordable rental programs to help them build wealth? And there have been some um, experiments around um, building equity for renters um, and financial literacy for renters in affordable housing programs in places like St. Louis and Cincinnati. I could forward some articles. I don't know how successful those have been. I don't know how widespread those things are used. I think it's worth taking a look at because I do think that the ship has kind of sailed on market rate, affordable, middle income housing. The market is just not going to produce, like we were talking about, middle income um, housing. <laughs> it's not going to produce single family homes or even duplexes or townhomes for the most part that are less than a million dollars, right? So how can we as a city help people who are renters to, to build their financial literacy and build equity and build wealth? Um, and I think there are tools to do that, that we could maybe explore and that could maybe someday become part of the inclusionary housing, what we do with our money from inclusionary housing. And this is where I wanted to pull up that slide, Jay and Sloan, I don't, I don't know if you have that slide from the presentation to city council that talks about how much are we injecting into these various products, right? Um, thank you. I think this is just so instructive, right? So for new rental construction, it looks like, tell me if I've got this wrong. Um, it costs the city $80,000 to $110,000 per unit as a subsidy to get that done, basically. Ownership acquisition, $100,000 to $110,000, and new ownership construction, $500,000 to $600,000. Am I reading that right, Jay and Sloan? Is there more you want to say about this? Like, it... um, No, I mean, you, you read it correctly, that there is a huge discrepancy between um, the that's why Mark started off saying, you know, how many additional rental units we could get for each new ownership. So we tried to make that super clear for council. And I think it is part of the, the conversation and it has to be part of the, the policy discussion. Thank you. And so so this is what I'm focusing on right now is like that half a million dollars for each unit of new ownership construction that the city has to inject. And I'm guessing we don't get back. This isn't like shared equity and we're gonna get it back when the house is sold. This is like a one-time infusion, we'll never see it again. How many people could be helped with some kind of equity building um, program for renters that we wouldn't have to do a $500 million dose per family, right? But we could help more people build wealth in more ways. Could, so, could you, I'm sorry, could you clarify ownership acquisition? I'm not, I'm not clear on what that means exactly. Sure, so um, that's the example I gave. Uh, of the, how the city in the past couple of years started going out and buying um, basically condos on the market uh, and doing a, a little bit of rehab uh, and then reselling them, buying down the price and reselling them to an eligible um, buyer in the affordable housing program. Um, that estimate's actually a little low. It's it's really 100,000 up to closer to 180,000. Um, depends on the number of bedrooms. So we've been trying to purchase uh, more two bedroom and three bedrooms. And of course, those are at the upper end of that range. Does that help? It, it does. Um, it, would be, it would be interesting to, to Laura's point. So when you talk about the ownership acquisition being, let's say, 100 to 180,000 um, and being two to three bedroom, what would the new rental construction, would that also be two to three bedroom or would that be closer to zero to two bedroom? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Michelle, do you remember? I think it's the same in terms of you know the range, depending on the size of the construction. But oh, you think you think the eighty to one hundred and ten thousand for rental units is two to three bedroom, and you think the ownership acquisition is also two to three bedroom? 
Well, it, it's it's a bit challenging to compare the ownership versus the rental because the, the, this is city subsidy, right? So new rental construction, that's typically what we help BHP with the subsidy. So we're filling their gap. They're getting all sorts of other financing through, you know, LIHTC, state and federal, other state grants. So it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges, unfortunately, but it's just for comparison what the subsidy is from this expected from the city. Got it. But the, but it might not be an apples to apples. It might be an apples and oranges. Exactly. Thanks. Okay, Thank Laura, go ahead. You were... Yeah, I, I, I think I made my point, which is that, you know, I, I really appreciate the the data and the analysis and everything that staff are bringing forward. And I think it will help HAB planning board the city as we go forward and look at our options. Think about how do we want to use this pot of money? Because I agree that um, I'm sure there is a subset of folks who are leaving the city in order to buy housing in other markets because that middle income slice is just it is a very, like Jay said, a very, very difficult nut to crack. And it looks very expensive for the city per family to help these families. And is that our priority? I think is a conversation we need to take a good, honest look at and have that conversation. Even though I really appreciate the work that staff has done to, to say, hey, the city set a goal. They set this middle income homeownership goal. What are some of the ways that we can reach it? And now I think that conversation is maturing to the point where we can say, okay, now that we know what it takes to reach it, is that still our priority? Thank you. Come on. Hi, thank you. Um, I have my main comment is one I think I hope piggybacks on what Laura's been talking about, but I actually want to uh, push back on one uh, assumption that she was making, and that is. Um, uh, there's a famous quote that uh, a friend of mine likes to likes to uh, pull out that uh, markets are a good servant, a poor master, and a worse religion. And um, uh, Laura, you you were saying that markets are never going to uh, um, um, uh, you know produce middle income housing. And um, I, I that that to me that's a kind of um, that's a kind of like. Uh, poor master uh, paradigm where, um, I mean, if, if you want to do thought exercises about how markets could produce middle income housing, you could you could say, well, what if we had a lot of eight plexes on any quarter acre lot? Um, I, the markets would 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 eagerly and, and excitedly um, provide all kinds of products and that that would uh, allow, it, you know, in, in a lot of different price points. Uh, but we don't allow that. We just sort of out, out of hand say, well, we don't want that kind of density. We favor single family homes and we favor large lots. And um, so uh, all that to say, like, there are ways to think about markets and housing markets that would uh, allow us to have the wind in our sails. Um, an interesting chapter that I read a couple of years ago is uh, is is in the book Radical Markets, where um, it's a completely wild uh, thought exercise, but it it does it does open up possibilities for ways um, that you can that, you know because we're, we're this whole conversation is kind of constrained by the market as as we know it now, um, when in fact we we've badly distorted the market in so many ways by the way we financed you know, basically socialized um, home mortgage financing, you know, and um, so it, uh, I, I don't know if that's um, uh, a productive debate to have or not. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's maybe requires more regional and, and national uh, kind of planning. Um, what did I want to say, though? The thing I wanted to say is a related um yeah, it, it's related to, I think, what Laura said about um, prioritizing home ownership. Um, I, I just, I just want to also challenge the whole notion that home ownership is better than renting. Um, that, that, um, that appeals to me. I, I would prefer to be a homeowner than to be a renter. Um, I'm currently a renter right now. I've always kind of thought of myself as a future homeowner, and so I, I don't, uh, affiliate as strongly with renters as I as I ought to because I've been a renter for a really long time and I'll probably continue being a renter and so like <laughs> I had to just come out and identify as a renter and and um, uh, get on board with renters' rights and I I know um, 
uh, Mark Fearer, who commented earlier, has uh, has uh, we've had some good conversations about that. But I, I just want to point out that um, in other countries, uh, uh, I'm thinking of, of Europe, uh, the, uh, home ownership is not such um, a central value. Uh, lots of people rent. Um, there's ways of thinking about community pride and um, uh, you know community ownership um, in, in the context of rentals. And I think that if we, you know, as a country, we didn't um, uh, finance, you know, make make it so that like the only way to have stable renting uh, housing is to subsidize uh, mortgages and so that you get the fixed payment and then you pay it off and you're done. Um, uh, you know, homeowners are just subsidized in a way that renters aren't that allows for stabilized payments and costs. So. Um, uh, and there's a lot more to say about that. I, I just, um, if if the issue is like a discrepancy between whether it's better to rent or to own, we could we could actually just like ask those questions about well, how can we make life more stable or improve civic engagement with renters? So, I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Okay, Sarah. Okay, well, um, that uh, I'd like I would like to request that when we come back to this conversation in planning board, that that uh, page from the uh, presentation to city council that Laura called up actually reflect all the other subsidies that go into building all those other types of housing units. Because then we're actually gonna be able to see what the subsidies are and it'll help us to think through the question of uh, the cash in lieu, the, I mean, cash in lieu is gonna stick around. It's not going anywhere, but it would be helpful also for our discussion about is cash in lieu worth it? Because those subsidies will be reflected in the total cost of building subsidized attached units or apartment rental apartments. And I think that the document, that one pager is not an, it's a, I, I don't know whether it's an accurate or not accurate. It is not a complete set of data. And if we're gonna use it, let's have a complete set of data about the um, various subsidies that lead to certain types of housing unit outcomes. That would be very helpful. Thank you. George. Um, thank you. Um, as a uh, as a father of two girls and uh, an uncle of of uh, many nieces and nephews who live in Boulder, um, I sort of experienced firsthand in our school systems, et cetera, that you know uh, the, the 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 middle class is is, is evaporating here, and so I I, I appreciate um, what staff is brought forward and the idea that there is a, there is an appropriate place for a slice of RIH program to focus on um, more middle class uh, ownership. Um, I, I think of the, of the teachers that my kids have had at Foothills, only one owns their home in the neighborhood and uh, she bought it 30 years ago. Um, I, I went, I attended the, uh, the, uh, the eight week fireman uh, Citizens Firemen Academy here, and at the time, which was a few years back, there were 102 firemen, and of the 102 firemen on staff, 101 lived outside of the city. Only one lived in the city, and so um, for a lot of people, and I, and I appreciate Philip's comments around um, some of the uh, some of the the thought, the the bigger thoughts, right? That you know, the structural thoughts that maybe. Um, maybe, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a different reality or a different, um, you know, if we were having, you know, if we were, if we were in a different country, perhaps um, people wouldn't feel the need of pride of ownership and stability um, uh, and, and, and to, to, to have ownership be a component of our IH program. But I, I, I think, you know, a little bit more grounded in the reality of our, of, of the context of where we're at and where we're headed, that these programs that we're talking about are, are, are really important. 
Um, and I, I think it doesn't negate all the other components of the IH program. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think it's a, a worthwhile presentation. I appreciate staff's um, focus on that. Um, and also the focus on all the other IH, IH components, but I don't want to, I don't want to lose this entirely, um, the, the discussion around this particular item versus, you know, other things that we can be doing simultaneously. So thank you. Lisa. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna agree with pretty much everything George, you just said. I'm from Boulder. I was born here. I went to high school here. I graduated from Fairview. My friends are gone. They tried to buy here. They could not. They bought in Erie. They bought in Louisville. I know people who bought in Westminster originally because it was all they could afford and then were two teachers. One of them who one of them works for BBSD has been commuting in from Westminster because they could not buy here. They barely made it over the line into Superior because they were rapidly paying down a 15 year mortgage to try to build enough equity to try to get somewhere close to back in. Like, I think the barbell analogy is the best example. It's great. And I do not want us to rob Peter to pay Paul. I'm very, very proud of our affordable housing. I'm proud of our rental program. I'm proud of what we offer to folks. And I think we're going to keep having incredibly expensive housing. I'm not worried about that. Um, you know, it's a very desirable place to live. But not only are we losing the middle class and losing people who've been here who want to be here. I, again, I, I have friends wanted to buy in Boulder. I will always be in Boulder. But they, they swore that up and down, bought in Lafayette. Could not find something to buy in Boulder. Their girls go to school in Lafayette. That's why we're looking at elementary schools closing here while we're looking at opening new ones in East Boulder County. Some of this is due to the age of our housing stock, the type of our housing stock, all of that, the fact that we've got a lot of people aging in place. I won't go off about Golden West Manor losing the last Medicaid, <laughs> you know, place that anyone could go in Boulder, it's gone. Um, but we, we need to be looking at how do we retain community because not only are we losing those families and losing, again, when I worked for the city, every year you could see fewer and fewer and fewer people who could actually live in the city. Everyone was in commuting. And then we yell about how we don't like in commuters. And I'm like, well, what are they supposed to do? Do you want firefighters or not? Snow drivers sleeping on couches in people's houses, snowplow drivers so that they could actually make their shift in the morning. Would have loved to live in Boulder, could not afford it. You know, so, I, again, I, I'm not saying that I don't want us to also continue to invest, and I think we are in lower middle income, but we need to figure out, and I think we had some great comments too about, you know, what about duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes? That's not what we're talking about right now, but I think there are things that we can do around that. I'm really interested in the presentation you guys had about, and it makes total sense to me that lot division doesn't necessarily <laughs> equal, you know, more middle income, but I just want to so strongly push back on the idea that we don't need to be focused on middle income. We have to like we, we are losing boulder as a community we are losing families and it's nice that there's all these older folks who are still going to be around sorry to anyone older than me who's going to take care of you who's going to drive in and how much are we going to have to pay them to come in you know so i i just i think it's completely appropriate that we're looking at middle income i don't think there's an easy fix but this is the piece we've been missing and that's why we call it the missing middle and and i just really want to push back i'm not continuing to focus on that and you know, I, I think this is exactly what we should be doing. This is the, the thing that's, I don't want to say save Boulder, but it's, you know, it's changed a lot in ways that I think aren't just demographically trending. You know, it's, it's, it's where we're getting these two extremes and that's all that's left. Um, and it's going to keep going that way if we don't make changes. Mark. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate Lisa's impassioned comments about uh, who who will uh, who will be um, our employees, our employers, <clears throat> who will uh, take care of our elderly. It's 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 such pertinent questions in my personal life at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I also want to say, as our conversation, you have, uh, I, I, don't, I forget the exact number of people that are participating in tonight's meeting, but it's a bunch and we're all uh, impassioned about housing and, uh, and our conversation has broadened beyond uh, Boulder's inclusionary housing program. And I think that points to that 
no matter how well we do with our inclusionary housing program and push and stretch it, um, unless we make some bigger moves, we will continue to, to lose ground. And, and so the point I wanna make is our governor has um, focused recently on broad housing policies and without a lot of specifics. So I can't say, I support him 100%, but I support his efforts to focus on housing. And I hope Boulder uses uh, Carl Castillo in the, in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs to shape rather than um, fight or um, try to retain some of our privilege and control of our single family zoning and neighborhoods. I hope that, um, that the governor's efforts give us some courage as, as Councillor Yates pointed out in the ADU regulations that we didn't have the courage to go as far as we should have in 2018. And now it seems like this council does. And I think um, it's going to take some courage to rather than fight uh, a statewide effort to increase housing opportunities, to help shape it and broaden it and make it work for Boulder. So I hope that we, uh, our planning staff and our housing staff um, continue to try to make, make uh, work with our statewide effort to increase housing opportunities. Thank you, ML. Thank you, John. I've been <laughs> I've been kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> um, thank you, staff, for the amazing presentation. Lots and lots and lots of of really valuable information, and I really appreciate um, the changes that you're looking at at making to uh, some of the. Um, I guess potential in the IH program. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fly the little ADU banner just because I think that one of the trends that we have seen with well a couple of things around ADU. So um, some of the ADUs are coming in even smaller than the IH basics on that little chart about <laughs> what the minimum size for this that and the other. I don't know how they would continue to qualify for affordable ADUs if they're not meeting those criteria, but just, just a point. Um, but the um, thing we have seen with ADUs is that they're trending toward not being rented. You know, people will um, deal you to affordable and they do that because they know they're not going to rent them. They're going to use them. They're either going to move into them themselves, the original owners, or they're going to have their children or keep them, you know, to use for family visiting, however. So the, I think the piece here that comes and goes kind of very stealth-like on the table is what about selling ADUs. And I'm not talking, I, I know Boulder County says we don't want to parcel, we don't want to break parcels up, land lease. Sell ADUs, they would definitely sell below what any single family house would sell for in the city. Um, there are hundreds of lots that could, and people, homeowners, would be able to afford to build the ADU to then sell it because they would get the money from the sale. These are regular people that own many of the single family houses where the original houses, where the potential for ADUs exist. One of the hurdles is how to finance them. It, it, 300, 300 grand to build an ADU starting. Um, so to open up the potential for still keep the requirements, owners got to live on the property and all that, but to be able to sell it. And I think that that would bring 
all of Lisa's friends get an opportunity to buy houses in Boulder. You know, our children get to buy houses in Boulder. People who wouldn't um, afford the new developer-driven housing have an, have a, an opportunity that um, was taken off the table when our ADU policy was written because it says you can't sell it. And I would suggest that maybe that gets revisited in light of, um, it would solve a lot of the problems for people who don't, who could, but don't build an ADU because of financing. If it's gonna be a for sale unit, you don't have that hurdle. Um, you get to provide housing on your property and um, people get to come and live in amenity rich neighborhoods. That would never get to live in the amenity rich neighborhoods. So I, I'm just gonna put that out there. I know, well, I appreciate what IH is, is considering to do around um, you know, smaller houses and maybe just incentivize people to, to build the giant houses and remove a small house from a neighborhood, that sort of thing. But I think that this potential to create a housing market for sale would start to capture that middle income that is so sorely um, missing out and getting to live in the city of Boulder. So I, I, I know that it's out of the scope of what we're talking about tonight uh, directly, but I, I think the overall conversation of how, where, are, where is that um, potential to uh, not count on the developer because, you know, the profit margins tend to, tend to mess up the um, desire for people to just, okay, let's just make this housing meet these uh, buyer guides, buyer targets. Um, this is a whole different market. Uh, selling out the uh, ADUs. So that's that's my kind of input. I I'm I'm a big fan of you know let's try to get housing, affordable housing, into everything we build. Um, so I don't think the ADU uh, creating the affordable option as a rental is working out really well. I don't think we're getting what we want. I don't think we're moving the needle. I think if we, if we uh, and maybe it's a pilot, um, have a for sale option, I think we could start to see a housing product come into the market that um, I don't see how else it, it, nobody's going to build small houses in amenity rich neighborhoods on single family lots for sale. It's just not going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'll throw in my two bits worth. I don't see any other hands up right now. I, I would say that it's, uh, I've had my hand up for a while. Oh, really? Who's yeah. Like, uh, Dan. Okay. Kind of most of the evening, so I, I don't know if it didn't pop up or something. Oh, go ahead uh, then. I, I guess I, I just uh, a few short things. Um, first thing I'd say, I, I do appreciate ML <clears throat> those points on ADUs. I think um, at the last HAB meeting, we did talk about the whole notion of how um, zoning policies fit into all this and um, according with that um, comp plan policies, and I do think that probably that's somewhere where, where this conversation can carry a lot. There's a lot of pragmatic concerns regarding being able to sell ADUs, but I think the notion of how you could develop property or redevelop property so that you have smaller lots that include affordable units. I know Michael was uh, uh, talking to that a little bit before. I think that's really relevant, and I think that's something that we um, all collectively should you know keep that conversation going on. Um, I, I, I also just wanted to... Uh, just state how much I appreciated Lisa's comments on um, middle income. And I, I think it's it's absolutely important. I think the other fact of it too, and from a community perspective is the fact that there are so many different programs that are available on a state and national level. You know, LIHTC, 
um, Section 8, whatever it may be, for the different um, the different income levels. But middle income is something that you really need to take a look at as a community because there's not a lot of programs that are out there on the state or federal level that can help assuage those concerns. So that's just another point that I wanted to make. And I think speaking for what we've been working on and focusing on HAB for the um, past year plus, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion on that. And I think we all recognize, you know, the extreme importance of uh, the missing middle for, for the city of Boulder right now. And um, I absolutely support those comments. And I've heard a lot of stories like that of people who actually grew up here and now they can't live here, even though they grew up here and want to stay in the community and serve the community that they grew up in, especially if they want to serve the community in ways that might not be as fiscally rewarding as other as other endeavors, right? Your plow driver, fireman, teacher, whatever it may be. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to state regarding um, the whole thing with the uh, appreciation cap on uh, ownership housing, I point to Summit County, Eagle County, Pickin County, and I think a few other jurisdictions where they actually had to, and I'm sorry if you can't hear me, I'm, uh, uh, my voice is pretty shot, but where they've actually had to lower that appreciation cap because they had it too high at first. And what they found was over time, things were becoming less and less affordable for the market they were trying to serve, which is local employees. And you know, I think Jay mentioned the fact that there is a formula. As long as we have a formula where we can keep revisiting that, um, from point to point to make sure that we stay um, on top of that and that one thing's not outpacing the other. You know, I think the appreciation cap is absolutely important to maintain the housing that we're establishing and to do so in a manner where we, uh, um, you know, can, can uh, really keep the progress that we're making as we build on our inventory. So I just wanted to bring that point up too, because I think that's something that, you know, there's a lot of good examples where, um, it hasn't worked as well as we would have hoped at a higher appreciation cap in other communities. And so that's something that I just flagged for a uh, pragmatic reality of it is that the, if the appreciation cap is too high, um, then the, the next generation is missing out on those. And, you know, like Jay said, uh, we're talking about housing that, you know, the whole notion, if the average is about seven years, the whole notion is it's a great way for somebody to get their start and to get a footing within the community. If they want to stay where they are, awesome. But if they want to move on, it gives them that opportunity to move on. Maybe not, you know, flatly financial, but the tax benefits that they get from a mortgage, like Philip said, whether or not that's good for policy. And Philip, I kind of agree with you on that, but it is what it is right now. So there's tax benefits and there's a lot of other, you know, benefits, both actual and intrinsic involved in that, that I think are really important. So, um, you know, I just think it's it's really good to make sure that we don't um, go too far at just looking at it from the fiscal gain, because then we lose sight of the other big important policies that are behind that appreciation cap. So that's all I've got. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll try and uh, get my two bits worth. Then I I can hardly believe how many people I agree with here. It's <laughs> it's very uh, unusual for me. But uh, I'd like to make two two particular points that uh, I think are are very relevant. First of all, I I sympathize also. There's four Gerstle kids grown who've grown up here, our kids and my brother's kids, and none of them are in Boulder, even though they they'd like to be. Um, and so so my family has has experienced similar similar situation to others who've mentioned it here. Um, I, I think that Philip made a very important and significant point uh, in his comments with respect to how we accept the market as dominating our decision-making process here. Um, I think that we have the ability to have much greater influence on the real estate market than, than has been discussed tonight. Uh, there's a variety of tax policies and other policies that the city could adopt to discourage large houses, to encourage uh, more folks in bedrooms. Um, and I think that we have been notably lax on addressing those potential uh, policies that would result both in perhaps diminished real estate values and 
increased ability for people with middle incomes to, to live here. Um, the other main point is that I think uh, we, we need better information as, as Daniel pointed out, we need a, a clearer decision manner in which to make decisions, in which to compare apples to oranges in the options that we're dealing with. Um, I, I think that the, what we've been presented with tonight is excellent, and it's opened our eyes a bit. But I don't think that we are really making, going through a pop, uh, proper decision-making process unless we can have these clear trade-offs in front of us that we know what, what we're trading off. And for example, I just point out what, what Mark was talking about earlier, the, the pros and cons of cash in lieu versus building on site. It, it may be, and he may be entirely right that cash in lieu produces more housing. But does it result in the town that we ultimately want to live in? Uh, there are many, many uh, objectives to our programs. In addition, just to providing housing, we want it to be attractive housing. We want it to, to attract the people that we are seeking to attract. Uh, so I, I think there's a variety of trade-offs that need to be made more clear in developing these decisions. Um, but beyond that, I, I would like to thank staff for this excellent presentation tonight because we have learned a lot and it will make our thinking better in the future. So thank you. And I'll open it up to any other, there may be other comments that people want to make. I just want to say thank you to staff too. This was great and really helpful and much appreciated. And it was great to have this collective meeting as well. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, Laura. Um, I think my last comment is just going to be, I think both the conversation in, in this forum and also back at City Council, you know, we're having a really hard time separating out all of the policy tools at our uh, potential disposal to deal with middle income housing and increase the stock of middle income housing and make it more possible for people like the Gersel kids and Lisa's friends and the kids in George's neighborhood to, to own a house in Boulder or to stay in Boulder in some fashion. We have a lot of policy tools that could help us do that. And the one that we've really been asked to focus on tonight is inclusionary housing, or at least that's how I've interpreted our charge tonight. So I just wanna make sure that my comments about um, how we focus that particular pot of money and the, um, the kinds of incentives that we offer through inclusionary housing. I'm not sure that inclusionary housing, in my opinion, is the right tool to focus on middle income. I'm fine with the current slice that's dedicated to that. My concerns are just around with the limited amount of opportunities and funding that we have in that particular program is expanding middle income the priority. I definitely agree that we need more and better tools to enable middle income in Boulder. Um, the, the kinds of things that were mentioned tonight, ML's discussion of, um, of uh, potentially selling ADUs separately, the concept of changing our zoning to allow something besides uh, single family homes, very large single family homes, uh, what John said about disincentivizing single family homes and, and using our code to incentivize production of some smaller units. There's been discussion of cooperatives and how that can be a tool that encourages uh, and allows middle income folks to stay in Boulder. Like I think we have lots and lots of tools for that. And and I think this is a challenge for city council, it's a challenge for us, it's a, it's a challenge for staff of, you know, each of these pieces are interdependent. And right now we're focusing on just this one. And so how do we adjust just this one without the broader context of, well, if we don't do it here, where are we gonna do it? Because we do need to do it. We absolutely, like Sarah said, this is a challenge that's important. We absolutely shouldn't fall off the table. We absolutely have to face it. For me, the question is just how much of it needs to come down to what we do in inclusionary housing. And is this the focus for that pot of money? So I don't, I don't want my comments to be misinterpreted 
because I tend to get very wonky and very focused. Um, so I just wanted to provide that broader context and, and also second the comments that I'm so glad we're having this joint conversation. I'm so grateful to staff for teeing all of this up and, and helping us wade through and make sense of this very, very complex landscape. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Okay. Any more comments? All right. Well, so can I just say thank you, John? So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, thank you, everybody, for staying this late and for all your contributions. It's extremely helpful. Um, and I'm glad that you found this helpful as well. Um, and Laura actually covered most of what I was going to say. That there are lots of other tools there, there's lots of different avenues to address um, middle income. And they're coming before you and council in the coming months, the zoning for affordable housing, the planning reserve occupancy, all these other tools in the toolbox are getting examined. And I just wanted to reiterate that that staff is coordinating on all of those efforts and trying to figure out how they're all intertwined to make sure that we're not um, pulling a lever here and having unintended consequences elsewhere. And John, just finally, I fully agree. This was just laying the stage. We will definitely have more information for you um, as decision makers uh, in terms of what are the policy trade offs? What does that mean? Um, and provide as much data as we possibly can. So, with that, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Any questions, let us know. Um, if you need anything, reach out. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Thanks very much. John, All right. We still, have, we still have a matters component. Yes. Yes. The meeting is over. <laughs> so go ahead. Bye to everyone except planning board folks. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Hab, for joining us. Okay. So now we can move to matters from from staff first. Brad, you're on. Yes. Good evening. Uh, planning board members. And uh, it sounds like you appreciated the uh, information we learned about tonight as, as much as I did. And um, I know our staff does too. So uh, glad to get the thumbs up on that and, and appreciate the, the discussion around that. Um, it's important that we do have kind of good cross awareness about these major uh, land issues that, that um, go across different departments. Um, I have no uh, real comments for this evening other than to thank you for making time for a, a special additional meeting tonight. And I'm also happy to answer any questions that might be uh, um, in, in your minds at this point. I will note if you hadn't been tracking it already that council has two major work program items up for final consideration on Thursday. That's the updated uh, use table and the site plan criteria. So uh, that has been, as you all have been very involved with and know, a um, long time in the coming. So uh, we'll look forward to those um, uh, hopefully being finalized on Thursday. Okay, Lisa, you have some thoughts there? Uh, yeah, um, something I'd love to hear on, but I don't know if it needs to be like a matters item or information item or if it could just be not even a white paper, but maybe just like forwarding us information that already exists. Um, I'm curious about kind of ongoing metrics around some of the missing middle stuff. So I'm curious about like, I know that BVSD convened, um, uh, I don't know, a citizen group or a board or something to um, look at school closures, you know, at the same time that we're looking at opening more in Erie and I think Lafayette maybe. Um, I'd be curious to hear that. I don't know that it needs to be again, like a 10 minute PowerPoint or anything, but if BBSD has something on that, I'd be really curious to hear it. Um, and then also I would love updated figures, which may already exist on just how many city employees have to commute in, <laughs> you know, and if, if we could break that down, um, I don't know, I don't wanna to be too specific where people feel like their personal information is being reviewed, but like around, you know, certain departments or pay brands or areas of responsibility. Um, those are things I just would be curious to look at. Um, but again, I'm not sure it needs to be something we spend a whole lot of time on. I just like to have 
a little more transparency on it um because i think it's good to think about sure yeah if, if i'm hearing you correctly um lisa you're asking if we have this information then could we pass it on um so that any existing metrics um, that we have on middle income and then uh employee commuting yeah and then anything that bvsd has i imagine bvsd is playing their cards pretty close to the vest so they don't get a bunch of people screaming at them which i totally appreciate it's coming but <laughs> they're trying to delay um but any anything they have it they're ready to share it it would just be interesting to kind of see what's okay. going on all right but, you know you can go in and like see the numbers which i've done but i'd be yeah. curious to see what they're where they're at okay yeah we'll see what we can get Sarah. yeah um, first just a response to lisa i know back in 2019 bvsd put out a survey on the number of families with children that were moving into the um uh transit village and it was extremely low it, uh, yes and um so i think i'm sh i'm assuming they must be keeping I, I shouldn't assume anything but so there's that data and maybe there's some updated data as well um and then also uh, a couple of years ago um um lions discovered that um people who had built adus were illegally subdividing their lots <laughs> so um, so that's something to just bear in mind vis-a-vis um, -vis ML's suggestion of selling second homes on single family lots. Um, I don't know what, um, I don't know how Lyons responded to that. Um, I just know that it happened a couple of times and it became an issue for the city council. Um, now, the thing I actually wanted to ask, which has nothing to do with any of this conversation tonight, um, is uh, can we, how far in advance can we get clarification on when the fourth thir Tuesday of the week of the month is actually gonna be used for a hearing? You know, um, I am trying to schedule other things on the open evenings and um, a little concern that, um, it, let me ask it this way. Can we ask for like two months in advance knowing that this, the fourth, Thursday, Tuesday, if I still think we meet on Thursdays, the fourth Tuesday of the month is going to either will be a hearing or not a hearing so that um, uh, we have that versus there may be a hearing. Yeah, I, I'm happy to talk, uh, you know, with staff on that and some of the history on that. I, I will speculate a little bit, uh, Sarah, that that by the very fact that it's optional is essentially a, a safety valve for when too many items are stacking up on to a particular agenda. And some of that we probably really don't know until the month prior because there's that kind of ebb and flow of whether an applicant actually got something in when we thought they would and, and some things like that. We try to map that out fairly far in advance. Amanda and, and Devin, you you all send the calendar in, in advance. Do do either of you have any kind of insights into that? And, and, and again, we can have a conversation with Charles and others, but just yeah. offhand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're you're totally correct there. So the fourth Tuesday meeting is really just a placeholder for overflow items if need be. Um, there's not really anything scheduled as to as of right now for up until at least May for any of the fourth Tuesdays. But again, that could change um, depending on if there are <laughs> overflow items. I just wanted to clarify, Sarah, were you, you were using the word hearing and, and was that synonymous with meeting or did you mean meeting at which there was a hearing? Synonymous. Okay. An event of some sort <laughs> on that day. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll go back and talk through that. Uh, you know, ultimately it could be a uh, I, I suppose more uh, perspective decision when when you do the agenda scheduling the the two that are, which I think has been you and John historically, if I remember. I, I don't know. I don't attend those. So I, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's correct. So you know that would be an option to just be, uh, you know, more specific and saying no, we're not going to do it, and pushing it out a couple of months. Of course, we always push up against the 
pension I, of applicants yeah, so saying, what, hey, we want what this. Is the, what is the criteria for staff to determine what public issue, what issues get put on the public agenda, on the public meeting agenda? Like, because you guys are the ones who know what the timing, the timeline of things are. So. Do, do you mean public? hearing like where there's yeah, public so, hearing I mean, with the there must notes. be there must be some criteria that you have for maybe it's you know a 30 day window that is required by law for something 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 like i'm just trying to understand yeah. like is the or, or it's going to council and, it, and this is our kind of last yeah, chance to push devin and amanda can keep me honest but i'm fairly sure it's here like other places which is we're not obliged to get things on a calendar by a certain date, but when an applicant is done and ready and they've checked all their boxes, we get immense pressure to get it on the earliest uh, hearing we can. And, um, you know, at that point, they still have to go through the noticing. And so even as soon as possible can be a good 30 or more days out because we have to do the legal posting in the newspaper, wherever we do it, and those types of things. So. Um, well, I, I do recognize that we all signed up for the p potential of three meetings a month. Yeah. Uh, but I do think it would, if if there if the things that are time sensitive are what are going to council, then I think we should prioritize what's going to council, and things that are like concept plans and site reviews that can be a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. I understand you're getting pressure from applicants, and I'm just going to push back and give some pressure from us, um, and uh, just. So, because we do all have work, travel, and lives, and all that kind of stuff, and it is, it's it's very challenging to uh, not know, um, and to then have to scramble. You know, I, I personally trap. I I'm already scheduling May work travel, and I'm yeah. sure Laura is also. You know, we all have work travel, so it would just. I'm just. I'm going to offer some counter pressure to the applicant's pressure. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And, you know, as somebody who's, among other things, responsible for the health and well-being of staff, I'm keenly desiring to have them go to less night meetings than than necessary anyway. So uh, I'm, you know, very much aligned with that goal as well. Um, so, yes, we'll, we'll find in any possibilities we can to, to do that. Which is something I've been kind of pushing anyway. So, okay, let's see. ML, was your hand up or not anymore? Okay. All right, matters. We don't have an attorney here tonight. Matters from the board. Everyone just wants to go home and. Oh, Laura. Um, can I just ask a question of Brad? If you're still here, yeah. um, uh, if you yeah. happen to know, um, I'm. Very, as I'm sure we all are, I'm sad that John is uh, your tenure is is coming up uh, in April. But I am excited about the thought of a new planning board member, as we probably all are, and wondering who applied. Do we know when the applications for city boards and commissions will be made public, so that we can read them and uh, ponder our next colleague? Oh, John, I don't know. If, did you reapply, John? Are you? Did you apply to to stay on? This is my second time on. I, I think that was enough, probably. Okay, that's one question answered. Well, I appreciate your kind comments. Yeah, I, I do not know that. Devin, do you happen to know that? I don't. Um, I do know that we're going to be, get, be getting um, interviews with specific candidates starting later next month. Um, other than that, I don't know at this time, like the actual names of specific applicants or any of their background information. Okay, I think the <laughs> applications from having recently gone through this process, they are publicized on the city website. They are published so that we can read them. So when those are available, I'll, I'll be looking for them. But if anybody happens to notice that they're up, I'm, I'm eager to read them. I can check on that for you. Okay, thank you. Let us all know we're all interested. Okay, all right, anything else? Well, thank you for an interesting meeting tonight and uh, see you next week. Thank you all. I Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your work. Thank you.